How do you forget the night that changed everything? It was a Tuesday around 6 p.m., and I'd just started my shift as a truck driver. I'd picked up my customary load from a warehouse near Albany, Georgia. This time, I had to deliver it to Mobile, Alabama. Little did I know that this seemingly mundane drive would upend the delicate balance of my life. My name is Americus J. Broxton. People call me J for short. Truck driving was never a dream job for me. It was something I fell into after a few tumultuous years in and out of various gigs in my early twenties. As I cruised along on the highway, listening to an old rock station, I spotted an unscheduled car following close behind me. Not uncommon on these routes, I figured it was just another driver trying to make the time pass by playing cat and mouse. Hours went by, and the car remained adamant about tailing me all the way into Mississippi. Growing increasingly uneasy yet not panicking, I decided to pull over at the next truck stop in the hopes that they would lose interest and continue down the highway. Upon pulling in and parking my truck, I glanced at their now motionless vehicle. For what seemed like minutes, we sat there in silence until suddenly two men emerged from the car. They looked to be in their late forties or early fifties, with ratty, unkempt appearances that immediately sent a shiver down my spine. What do you want? I yelled through my half-opened window while keeping my engine ready to roar back onto the road if necessary. The taller of the two spoke first in an unsettlingly calm tone. We don't want trouble, he said. We're just here to recover what doesn't belong to you. The mystery of their intentions only served to heighten my fear and confusion. Hesitantly, I climbed out of my truck and, with bow rising in my throat, played along. What is it you think I've got of yours? I asked in a quivering voice. They exchanged glances and ordered me to open up the back of the truck. My heart raced when I suddenly realized that the cargo I was transporting might have held a dark secret. Prying open the doors, we were greeted by dozens of unmarked wooden crates. To validate their claims, they singled out one crate, which they professionally dismantled with precision, revealing its illicit contents. Cocaine Cocaine was so pure that it glistened in the dimly lit trailer like sinister shards of ivory glass. The taller man, whose name I never learned, calmly apprised me of how he'd been tracking my cargo through an inside source at my employer's company. His partner interjected briefly to remind him that this was all part of settling an ongoing dispute between rival cartels. Just as fast as it started, the unanticipated ordeal ended. The two men swiftly loaded their share of narcotics into their vehicle and vanished into the darkness, leaving me bewildered and slightly relieved. It took weeks and many sleepless nights to shake off that encounter, knowing full well how close I came to becoming a victim of these unrelenting criminals. The truth would remain elusive as to who these men truly were. Yet a bitter taste lingered in my mouth as the echoes of their conversation haunted me to this day. Never again would I take on another delivery job without questioning what twisted fate lay behind those wooden crates and the shadows it could cast by unsettled dangers lurking in our world. The weight of that night's events would go on to weigh heavily on my conscience in the days and months that followed. I couldn't help but feel responsible albeit indirectly, for the hands in which the illicit cargo would eventually end up. My once mundane drives now become a mental battleground between my desire to continue providing for my loved ones and the fear of becoming entangled in a sinister web once again. The very foundations of my reality had irreversibly shifted. Gone were the days of innocent detachment from the concealed evils lurking in plain sight. So I made a decision, one that would guide me onto a path far removed from my life as a simple truck driver from Albany, Georgia. Never one to stand idly by and resign myself to fate, 
I ventured into the world of private investigation. My plan was to infiltrate and expose the criminal underbelly that tied itself to seemingly ordinary citizens like myself. Armed with fragments of knowledge gleaned from shady corners of truck stops and fleeting encounters with underworld denizens, I began my transformation from America's J. Broxton, truck driver, to E.J., the crusading investigator. It wouldn't be easy. I knew I was playing with fire. But perhaps, somewhere down this dark path, I could find redemption for my past and forge a new identity as someone who stood tall in the face of adversity rather than cowering in its shadows. You ever get that feeling where the hairs on the back of your neck stand up? That's how my story begins, with a question. Why did I feel this way in such an ordinary location, carrying out my routine job as a truck driver? Little did I know what I was about to find out. It was a Wednesday evening, and I had been assigned a drop-off in rural eastern Pennsylvania. The roads were narrow and winding, and the sun had already set, casting shadows across my path. The silence of the area seeped into my truck cab as I drove deeper into the woods. My name is Eldridge Hamer. I just figured y'all should know who's telling this goddamn crazy story. I've been doing this job for well over 15 years. But let me tell you, that night, man, I couldn't shake off that eerie feeling. As I rounded the bend and pulled up near the secluded warehouse to unload my cargo, there was an unexpected tap, tap, tap on my passenger side window. Keenan Birchfield is one of those familiar faces you see around on late night deliveries. He was puffing away on a cigarette and asked if he could get some help unloading his own haul from a few miles down the road. Seemed harmless enough. We both drove to Keenan's desolate delivery spot. It looked like nothing more than an abandoned farmhouse surrounded by trees and silence. He motioned for me to help him with some heavy crates at the back of his truck, and that's when I noticed it. Scratch marks and what appeared to be bloodstains around one particular crate. Before I could even say something about it, we heard a gut-wrenching sound deep in the surrounding forest. It sounded like someone howling in pain as another scream echoed in response. We locked eyes for a moment before bolting back into our truck's safety. Those goddamn noises, though, felt like ice in my veins. It wasn't long before we realized we were being hunted. Started slowly, sounds of footsteps in the distance, catching a glimpse of a shadowy figure lurking in the half-light. We called the police, of course. But out there, isolated and with no cell reception, it ain't easy to get back up. What did you see out there, Eldridge? Keenan's voice quivered as he dragged on his cigarette. I don't know for sure, something bad, I replied shakily. Keenan went quiet over the radio for a moment before explaining how he'd been followed by some maniac named Virgil Stovall. Word had it that Virgil was fixated on Keenan because of an old feud between their families. Some serious bad blood stuff that went back generations. That eerie feeling had turned into a full-blown panic as hours passed and footsteps became distorted laughter from an unseen menace. We were trapped, with no way to reach the police or escape without meeting our demise. We barricaded ourselves in that abandoned farmhouse, waiting for that monster to show its face. When it finally did, goddamn it was Virgil all right, disheveled, scars streaking his filthy face and clothes, and an unhinged look in his eyes. I'm not going into much detail here, but Virgil had done some terrible things to some people not too far from our location things that would give anyone nightmares for years to come. There was nothing left but charred remains and unspoken horrors. 
An excruciating game of cat and mouse lasted for hours longer, and even when the cold break of dawn arrived, we hadn't fully escaped Virgil's clutches. It was only later that we found out his grisly end was delivered by none other than Keenan's cousin, Travis Birchfield, who tracked him down on a hunch. That town and those woods have since buried their secrets, trying to hide the evils that once existed there. It doesn't matter if I've been driving this route for fifteen long years. I can't drive past that godforsaken place without feeling my heart race and my hands sweat. And in the end, I'll always wonder, did we really leave Virgil behind, or is his name still etched in those bloody and abandoned shadows? Looking back on it now, I've learned a thing or two about fear and the unknown. The sort of darkness that can take hold of a person and burrow deep into their soul, changing them forever. As for Keenan, he never quite recovered from that night. He'd get jittery at the slightest sound especially when the sun dipped low in the sky. We didn't talk much after that, but that final conversation still rattles around in my head, an unwelcome echo of the terror we'd experienced together. You think it's over for good, Eldridge? He'd asked me one final time before we parted ways for what would be the last time. I thought about it for a moment, my throat dry and my heart pounding. I sure hope so, Keenan. I sure hope so. But even as I uttered those words, a chill settled bone deep within me, whispering doubts and lingering fears that maybe, just maybe, we hadn't seen the last of Virgil Stovall and his twisted form of retribution. How many times can our lives change completely in the span of just one night? I pondered over this, never expecting to find out the answer the way I did. My name is Grady Hendricks, and I've been a truck driver for almost ten years. Life on the road has always been an adventure, one that countless others have lived through. So, what set my experience apart? It all started when I decided to take a break at a rest stop near a small town called Buxton, Maine. Driving for long hours can be exhausting, and it was already past midnight. The place was quiet, with only a few other truckers around, chatting and refueling. It was then that Jamie, another fellow trucker, mentioned that some people had gone missing in that region lately. As skeptical as we might be about such disconcerting rumors, there seemed little reason to be concerned. After all, we had traveled through some of the most desolate places in America and had heard stranger stories before. We continued sharing road tales and interesting places we had visited while grabbing coffee and snacks from the vending machines. It's probably just some wild animals killing stray animals jeered Martin, who was known to annoy everybody with his casually insensitive retorts. We waved it off and got back into our trucks as it began to rain softly outside. As I pulled out onto the highway, I saw something unusual. A car had veered off the road and crashed into a nearby ditch. My curiosity was piqued when I noticed its doors were wide open. I parked my truck and rushed out to investigate despite the pouring rain. Calling out repeatedly for any survivors or passers-by who might have witnessed the accident yielded no answers. As I approached closer to inspect inside the vehicle, my heart raced when I saw some blood splattered on its dashboard. But there was nobody around, alive or dead, besides obvious signs of struggle. Were the rumors true? I had my doubts, Yet I couldn't dismiss that horrible gut feeling. Back on the road, I couldn't stop thinking about that crashed car and the unsettling atmosphere in the area. Even the weather seemed to grow colder and darker. Suddenly, I received a call from Jamie on my walkie-talkie. Though skeptical about each other's experiences, 
we had a tacit understanding that we would always be there in times of crisis. Grady, I've found another car, abandoned with its windows smashed, just a couple of miles away from where you saw that crash. Jamie's report filled me with dread, leaving me feeling we had somehow stumbled onto something much more sinister than mere coincidence. As we updated other truckers on our chilling discoveries, our watchful convoy redoubled its vigilance. Each new encounter with gruesome crime scenes only compounded our suspicions of grisly activities secretly preying upon this once tranquil region. Our desperate search led us to a remote backroad where we stumbled upon a horrifying tableau, bound victims lying in pools of blood with bullet holes through their heads, executed ruthlessly. The shocking brutality seemed almost impossible to comprehend and forced us to rethink our assumptions. Concealed motives and hidden truths were exposed as we pieced together the connections between these gruesome murders. It emerged that these victims all hailed from the same mob-linked family, suggesting a ruthless underground hitman who showed no mercy. The name, Alessandro Mancini, floated around as someone potentially involved in orchestrating the bloodbath. From small-town gossip to law enforcement probes, word spread rapidly regarding the ongoing slaughter, and it felt as if Alessandro would remain ever enshrouded in mystery. Being both horrified and fascinated by this cold-blooded assassin, our anguished fascination often flared into haunting nightmares. Time moves on despite tragedies piling on top of one another, but memories of those grim incidents never fade. Jamie and I continued to cross paths at similar rest stops where we first heard of the horrors, wondering about Alessandro Mancini, who he was and why he did what he did. Some questions are destined to remain unanswered, leaving us with a shadowy darkness that haunts our darkest nightmares. Years after that fateful night, one whispered name still sends chills down our spines, Alessandro Mancini. His brutal acts forever planted the seeds of terror within truck drivers like myself, who remain ever vigilant against the lurking menace hiding behind mundane events. The realization that evil can strike in the most unexpected places has forever changed the way I perceive my surroundings on the road. Our lives had been irreversibly altered by that one dreadful night, opening our eyes to the reality of true darkness hidden beneath seemingly ordinary circumstances. As truck drivers, we are always on the move, traversing different terrains and meeting new people. Yet, the terrifying events in Buxton, Maine, have become a cautionary tale that reminds us all to be on guard and never let our curiosity cloud our judgment. Even though years have passed, the ghost of Alessandro Mancini lingers in our minds. A vengeful specter who emerged from the murky shadows as a brutal reminder that true evil exists in this world, capable of tearing apart lives and families with chilling precision. And while we may never find answers to quell the haunting memories, we continue forward with a newfound sense of vigilance and caution for ourselves and for our fellow travelers on the road. Life may take us through unforgettable darkness, but we must not let it consume us. Instead, we use it as a driving force to remain watchful against any hidden horrors lurking just around the corner. Why did it have to be that day? It started out just like any other, but it would shake me to my very core. I'm Jake Maverick, and believe me when I say I've had my fair share of strange experiences as a truck driver. My old man was a trucker too. I guess you could say I was just following in his footsteps. Riding down endless highways, sleepless nights and truck stops, and an endless parade of greasy spoon diners. This is my life. I was pulling into Pinehurst Grove that Tuesday evening around 6.30, right on schedule. 
My goal for the night was to deliver a shipment of electronics to a big box store on the outskirts of town. As I backed into the loading dock, something seemed off. Usually, there were at least a couple of workers around during unloading times, but tonight was eerily quiet. Hey there, anyone around? I called out, hoping someone would answer. A man named Kevin finally emerged from the darkness and greeted me with a skeptical glare. Sorry about that, he said in a hushed tone. I've been tense around these parts lately. He focused back on his clipboard as we exchanged information. Sensing something was seriously wrong, I decided to probe further. What's going on? Kevin shifted nervously before responding. Kids have gone missing lately. On top of that, there's been talk about some weird guy hanging around the area. Our conversation was cut short when he realized he had other things to attend to and left without another word. At first, I thought Pinehurst Grove was just another sleepy town spooked by rumors, but when I chatted with some truckers at Brewster's Diner later that night, my fear began to grow. The people in this town were genuinely scared. The next day, during my stay at the local motel, I discovered something disturbing. I took a walk to clear my head and stumbled upon a crime scene in an abandoned building by the railway tracks. On the rotting walls, there was a hastily scrawled message. Beware Jeremiah Milner. I reported my findings to the local sheriff, Laura Thompson. Sensing my growing curiosity, she told me about Jeremiah Milner, a reclusive hermit who once lived in Pinehurst Grove. Apparently, He'd been involved with some criminals and happened to be less than stable himself. You think he's behind all this? I asked. Sheriff Thompson shook her head uncertainly. There's no information linking him directly to these awful events, but we haven't found any other evidence either. Days turned into weeks, and I couldn't shake my growing obsession with solving this mystery. I extended my stay in Pinehurst Grove and became increasingly involved in the locals' efforts to keep the children safe. One evening, word spread fast. Another kid had gone missing, and witnesses claimed they saw a figure lurking by the old schoolhouse on Oak Street. Due to the recent rash of disappearances, some locals have armed themselves. Fearful for their family's safety, they were now indiscriminately searching for any suspicious individuals. Without thinking twice, I joined them and found myself outside the abandoned church where our search led us. We combed through every corner when we suddenly came upon Milner, his eyes wild with fear as people surrounded him, demanding an explanation. I didn't do this. They took my daughter too. He cried out in desperation. The room fell silent as everyone tried to comprehend what they just heard. As we interrogated him further, it became clear that Milner was not responsible for these crimes. In fact, he had become obsessed with finding those responsible after his daughter disappeared months earlier. His sudden reappearance was driven by his need to bring those responsible to justice. In the end, the truth finally emerged. Documents exposing an underground organ trafficking ring were discovered, pointing to a local businessman and his associates. Jeremiah Milner had discovered this vile operation and had taken it upon himself to alert the town. Tragically, his daughter had been one of their earlier victims. The events that occurred in Pinehurst Grove will be forever etched into my memory. While Milner was a mysterious antagonist at first, it turned out that he was a grieving father seeking redemption for his loss. The real monsters were lurking right beneath our noses, hiding in plain sight while spilling innocent blood. In the aftermath of these chilling events, Pinehurst Grove was forever changed. The small town that had once been filled with whispers and fear began the healing process banding together to protect and rebuild their community. As for me, 
I couldn't bear to leave just yet. My connection to the people and my newfound respect for Jeremiah Milner compelled me to stay and help in any way I could. Milner and I worked side by side, volunteering at local shelters and setting up fundraisers to aid the affected families. We even formed a neighborhood watch organization to unite the townspeople as a way of ensuring a tragedy like this would never happen again. Months passed, and it was finally time for me to hit the road again, my trucker journey calling me back on the never-ending highway. But I knew that Pinehurst Grove would always hold a special place in my heart. As I pulled away from town, I felt a newfound purpose in life not just as a truck driver but as someone who understood the importance of fighting against the darkness that often hides in our own communities. From then on, every mile and every town I passed through became another opportunity to do what I could to make this world just a little bit better. Why did I choose to take the back roads that night? I was driving my rig down a narrow road in middle of nowhere Nebraska when I first saw the woman standing on the side of the highway. It was late, and there was an eerie silence that blanketed the area, something strange for a truck driver who's used to the hum of engines and tires on pavement, but I didn't think much of it at first. After all, people break down this way all the time. My name is Jake Marriott, and I've been driving trucks for almost 10 years now. Yep, just me and my rig across the vast expanse of America. You see a lot of things on these long hauls, sunsets that'll take your breath away, strange encounters at roadside stops, and sometimes even stuff you wish you could forget. As I pulled up beside her, I could see she was in rough shape. She had scratches on her arms and dirt staining her once white dress. Cautiously, I rolled my window down, ready to offer help. Are you all right there, miss? I asked. Her voice trembled as she stammered out her words. P please, help me. He's after me. I didn't hesitate. It was too cold out to leave this woman standing by herself on the side of some deserted road. I unlocked my passenger door and let her in. Once we were driving again, there wasn't much conversation, just an unsettling feeling gnawed away in my gut. But who wouldn't be uneasy with a frantic stranger in their rig? An hour later, we were passing through a small town when I noticed headlights trailing us. They seemed to be following our every move, an unusual occurrence considering how few cars are out at this hour. Pulling into a gas station parking lot, hoping against hope that we'd shake whoever was behind us off our tail, I asked the woman what was going on. My ex, she whispered, her eyes wide with fear. His name's Rick, and I think he's following us. I didn't pry further. Sometimes, it's better not to know all the details. As we continued down the road, her breathing became more erratic, and it soon became apparent that it was more than just her own ex-partner who was unsettling her. There was something downright sinister about this whole situation. We finally made a stop at a remote motel up ahead, checking in under an alias in an attempt to stay off Rick's radar. But as luck would have it, we were discovered. When I opened the door to our room that night, there he was the same headlights I'd been trying to shake off earlier, waiting behind my rig with a lead pipe in hand. The intensity in his eyes told me everything I needed to know. It was time to fight or flee. The next few moments were a blur. Screams, punches, and blood spattered against the cold asphalt like some twisted painting as a figure stumbled out of sight. You wouldn't believe what half a lead pipe could do to your temple. Everything came to an abrupt halt when sirens echoed in the distance, gradually growing louder. I know I'll have nightmares about that night for the rest of my life. 
Days after the ordeal drew to a close that terrifying week in Nebraska, my back pressing up against the corner of my cab for support, I received news from my contact on who Rick really was, one Richard Carter, a cold-blooded murderer on the run from multiple state authorities. My encounter with him just one of many horrifying stories etched across his bloody path of terror. And even though they say they have Richard safely locked up now, I can't help but wonder if there are others like him out there, lurking in the darkest corners of our open roads. It's been months since that harrowing night, and life on the road just hasn't been the same for me. Each new town I pass through is tainted with a lingering paranoia that I'm being followed by someone, or something, bent on destruction. The truth is, we truckers are a lonely, vulnerable bunch out here on these desolate highways, bearing witness to the shadows that others don't have to see. Sometimes, in life's darkest moments, we do what we can to survive and move forward. Our restless minds don't always grant us sleep filled with solace. Instead, they conjure images of battered faces and desperate cries of spectral figures standing beside our heavy cargo in the dead of night. But life goes on. I've made some changes since that near-death encounter with Richard Carter. I take fewer backroads now, and I'm more cautious about who I allow into my rig. Above all else, I've learned to trust my instincts. They're often the only thing standing between you and another's twisted intentions. As for the woman whose life I saved, I never learned her name. After we parted ways at a crowded truck stop during a much-needed pit stop following our ordeal, she vanished into thin air like a wraith escaping darkness. Wherever she's hiding now, I hope she's found safety and solace far from the evil that once hunted her down those lonely Nebraska roads. I carry on now burdened with the knowledge that beneath America's wide-open skies lies an underbelly riddled with secrets, violence, and strange encounters at every turn. This world is vast and complicated, one where people like me continue to wander alone through uncharted territory, taking solace in sunsets while stealing ourselves for whatever horror might be lurking around the next curve in the road. My life was ordinary, well, as ordinary as a truck driver's life could be. It was cool though, I met new people and saw a lot of the country. But on that fateful day in July, everything changed. My name is Rigoberto Johnson, but my friends call me Rigo. I'd been driving trucks for a few years, working for Martinson's Freight Incorporated, and had built a good reputation in the business. But the dark and sinister world of true crime has always been an unsettling fascination of mine. I was hauling cargo from Montana to Texas and had stopped at a roadside diner called the Lone Star Cafe. It was real old-fashioned, and you couldn't get more American than that. After ordering some food, I couldn't help but overhear two customers mentioning something odd about an abandoned farm down this dirt trail nearby. What struck me as strange wasn't their conversation per se. That type of gossip around isolated places is pretty common. But the way they were acting, constantly looking over their shoulders and lowering their voices whenever someone came close. Through my persistent eavesdropping, one name kept popping up somebody named Felton. Who was he? It was hard to know because the two patrons constantly switched stories and tried to piece together rumors they'd heard or events they'd experienced. Most people would have let it go at that point, but I'm not most people. Curiosity got the better of me that night, and instead of getting a good night's sleep or rolling right out of there after dinner, I decided to check out that abandoned farm for myself. As I walked down the dirt path beneath the moonlight shadows cast by skeletal trees, anxiety began festering in my gut. 
The farm was eerily still when I approached it. Barely visible through crumbling fences were decaying buildings masked by overgrown brush and tangled branches. That's when I saw her. She was sobbing softly. A woman around my age with short, blonde hair and torn clothes. She wasn't in good shape, gasping and leaning against the cold wall of the farmhouse. Help me, please, she pleaded. I hesitated before stepping closer, fear and suspicion clawing at the back of my mind, but her pain was genuine. It turned out that she had been held captive and tortured by someone named Felton for days on end, the name I'd heard earlier. He had apparently taken a break, leaving her chained up, but in his absence, she managed to free herself and escape. Together, we stumbled through the darkened premises to find my truck, when suddenly a figure emerged from the shadows ahead. It was Felton himself, his face twisted in rage at seeing his prey escape. Without thinking twice, I pushed the woman behind me and faced the maniac. The next few minutes felt like hours as we ran for our lives, eventually taking refuge in an old barn to catch our breaths. It was there that she finally introduced herself as Maddie O'Halloran. She had been abducted while out jogging, an activity as ordinary as it came. We devised a plan. Maddie would find a way to contact the police while I kept Felton distracted long enough for her escape. Easier said than done, of course. When Felton tracked us down, it was like running headfirst into a tornado of violence and pain. Every instinct I possessed screamed at me to flee. But there I stood, determined to make sure Felton wouldn't hurt Maddie any more than he already had. Maddie managed to slip away with no interference from Felton, who appeared unable to comprehend his blunder in leaving her unattended earlier. As we fought tooth and nail throughout the decrepit farmhouse, it became clear this man was no ordinary individual. It felt like I was in one of those nightmares where no matter how hard I tried to hit my attacker, the blows amounted to nothing. Just when I thought I wouldn't make it out alive, the sound of sirens pierced through the chaos, and Felton's face morphed into sheer shock. He tried to run but was soon captured by the police. We later came to find out that Felton O'Reilly was responsible for at least eight other disappearances and deaths in multiple states, a sick and twisted individual. When everything settled down, Maddie and I had the chance to reconnect and process what had transpired. We shared our stories, the bits and pieces that made us who we were before this life-altering encounter. In an odd way, we found solace in each other's company, brought together by a horrifying situation but bound by our innate desires to survive and protect one another. As time went on, our friendship grew stronger. We became each other's support systems as we navigated the aftermath of those traumatic events. In the following years, I continued to work as a truck driver, but my perspective on life changed. No longer was my job just about delivering goods across the country. It became a way for me to connect with and help people I met along my journey. Whether it was lending a listening ear or offering assistance in times of need, I found purpose beyond my job description. Maddie, on the other hand, dedicated herself to helping others who had been victims of crimes like hers. She became an advocate for support groups and a liaison between law enforcement and victims' families. Her experiences fueled her relentless passion for justice and healing in communities affected by tragedy. Although the trauma we faced at the hands of Felton O'Reilly left an indelible mark on our lives, Maddie and I refused to let it define us. Instead, we took those harrowing moments as an opportunity to grow stronger, individually and together, all while understanding that life is often anything but ordinary.
You know that feeling you get when something just doesn't add up? When things don't make sense but you can't put your finger on it. That was my life for a few weeks. It started on a seemingly ordinary day in August, as I was driving my rig along Route 66 in Arizona. The time was around 7 p.m., and I had just stopped at a truck stop to refuel and grab some food. As I walked back to my truck, I quickly noticed a lanky guy hovering nearby, talking into a payphone. Nothing too out of the ordinary, but it felt puzzling for someone to be using a payphone these days. I'm Jonah Miller, by the way. I'm 37 years old and have been crossing the country as an independent truck driver for about 10 years now. I earned the nickname, Buzzsaw, among other drivers due to my knack for navigating through tight spots, and I take pride in that. While driving away from that truck stop, something nagged at me about the encounter with the payphone guy. Little did I know that this wasn't going to be our last encounter. A few days later, after dropping off a load at my destination, I came across an eerily similar situation. Only this time, the payphone guy was suspiciously lingering near another payphone at a different state's rest stop. My gut told me there's something more happening here than just coincidence. He caught me looking at him and gave me a chilling smile before continuing his conversation. Things escalated when I found a picture of myself tucked under my windshield wiper the next morning. It was taken from behind, as if someone was, or still is, following me. The sight made my heart race. Suddenly it clicked that he must have been that payphone guy. I called up my buddy Miles Campbell, a former police officer who now works as a private investigator, and told him everything. He suggested I write down the times and locations where I saw him and that he'd help look into it. One night, in a small diner, I overheard a conversation between two locals about a string of violent robberies that recently happened around the area, all leading up to truckers being targeted and brutally attacked. My blood ran cold as I connected the dots. The payphone guy must be the one responsible for this terror. Miles confirmed my fears. After cross-checking police reports with my logbook, there were clear connections between my sightings and the attacks on other truckers. We shared our findings with the local police department and began searching for this maniac. As the days rolled on, anxiety gripped me any time I parked my truck. Every shadow or movement felt like a sign of impending danger. On one such occasion, as I stepped out of a roadside diner, something slammed into the back of my head, plunging me into darkness. I awoke in excruciating pain with no recollection of what happened after being hit. Pictures of mutilated truckers were scattered around me. He wanted me to understand his twisted motives but didn't reveal why he targeted us. Managing to break free from my bindings, Dialing 911 with shaky hands, heavily breathing, it was time for this nightmare to end. The police finally managed to capture him days later. His name was Leonard Nance, but only because he had stolen someone else's identity. His true identity remained unknown. Leonard had no prior criminal records or discernible motive. In prison now for an indefinite time, he is still hauntingly watching his surroundings, especially during phone calls, like a predator waiting for its next prey. Why did he do it? His dark deeds are forever etched into our minds, but not a single explanation justifies them. The chilling uncertainty of not knowing if he acted alone or if there were others out there like him, ready to strike one thing was for sure. No truck driver would ever truly feel safe again on these lonely roads. In the months that followed, truckers across the country banded together, sharing stories and providing support for one another. The tight-knit community stepped up their vigilance along the lonely roads and invested in security measures to protect themselves from any potential threats. As a collective, 
They established a network of communication to report any suspicious activity, an effort to ensure no one else would fall victim to such terror. With Leonard Nance locked away, the violent attacks on truckers eventually ceased, but an air of tension still filled every stop and pause on their journeys across America. The haunting memories of that night lingered in my mind for years as I continued driving. It was never quite the same. Although I regained some semblance of normalcy over time and pushed myself to keep going, a new mission drove my passion for being on the road. To encourage awareness and camaraderie among fellow truckers so we could protect ourselves amidst the vast uncertainties that stretch across the highways we call home. Have you ever found yourself wondering how a normal day can take the darkest turn imaginable? That was precisely what happened to me on August 14, 2015. My name is Jason Gallagher, and I've been a truck driver for almost 10 years now. I never expected to witness such horrors in my life, let alone become a part of them. It all started on an innocuous day. The job took me through Vail Pass, Colorado, which I never expected to be anything but calm and serene. Despite the beautiful scenery, that eerie question followed me throughout the day. A couple of hours into the drive, I decided to stop for gas at a truck stop near Vail. The place seemed dead silent except for one guy loitering around the side of the station. He looked nervous. His fingers kept fidgeting with his coat while he whispered something about needing help. Hey man, are you okay? I asked cautiously as I approached him. He chuckled unnervingly and looked up, revealing a face pitted with scratches and bruises. My name's Nate Harlow, he said hesitantly but firmly. I need your help with something. Curiosity peaked but wary of his intentions. We made our way back to my truck and talked about what led him there in such terrible condition. Nate mentioned that he had stumbled upon something he shouldn't have while working as a janitor at a motel nearby. He had overheard rumors of some mysterious individual who had rented a room there under an alias, someone by the name of John Doe. I know it sounds crazy, Nate said, his voice desperate and trembling. But this guy gives me chills, like he's hunting people down. He explained how he tried to leave town earlier that day but suddenly found himself being chased by a black sedan with tinted windows. Over the next few hours, Nate anxiously filled me in on how he tried to report his suspicions to the motel's owner and the police. But with no tangible evidence, they laughed it off. Feeling abandoned and alone, Nate turned to me. You're my last chance, he whispered. As I thought about whether or not to get involved in this harrowing situation, Nate pointed out a black car parked at a distance from us. I stepped out of the truck and peered through my binoculars to find the same vehicle Nate had described. My heart pounded like a jackhammer, knowing we were being watched. We decided our best move was to act like nothing was amiss and continue with our journey. Pulling out onto the highway, Nate became more tense as we noticed that same sedan following us from a distance. In an attempt to outsmart our pursuer, we took a detour down an isolated dirt road ahead. I had picked up a handheld CB radio back at that truck stop to establish communication among other drivers in case of emergencies like this one. Suddenly, my radio signal picked up faint chatter from different channels while static noises surrounded them simultaneously. It was an eerie sound that sent goose bumps up my spine. An unexpected turn led us straight into what seemed like a gruesome crime scene, bloodstains shattered glass, and unrecognizable human remains scattered all around. The sight of it made Nate nauseous. It was unlike anything either of us had ever witnessed before. 
In an instant, the black sedan appeared once again, closing in on us quickly. Panicked but determined not to be easy targets, we sped off down the dirt road, only for it to twist and turn into a complex maze of paranoia and darkness as the car relentlessly pursued us. After what felt like hours of cat and mouse with our mysterious pursuer, we managed to lose them just as dawn broke. Hurrying back to the main roads, we stumbled upon a newsstand where we overheard local residents discussing a string of brutal killings that had occurred in the area lately. One gruesome detail matched exactly what we had seen at the site earlier that night, multiple victims violently dismembered. This was no coincidence. Our foe obviously wielded wicked power and skill. Days later, Nate reached out to an old friend from his past, Leon, who used to work with the police. Over a tense and uneasy conversation, Leon divulged that law enforcement officials had been secretly investigating John Doe, a highly elusive serial killer wanted for dozens of murders across the country. Suddenly, the gravity of our situation hit us like a ton of bricks. We realized we were in the crosshairs of a cold-blooded murderer, and we couldn't rely on anyone but ourselves to put an end to this nightmare. Sleepless nights and paranoid thoughts became our constant companions as Nate, Leon, and I put together a plan to catch John Doe before he could strike again. We decided to use Nate as bait, arranging for him to be in areas where John Doe was likely to appear while I kept watch from afar. Leon utilized his connections within the police department to gain access to crucial information regarding the serial killer's patterns. Weeks went by with no sign of John Doe until one fateful evening, when we noticed his signature car lurking near us. We quickly implemented our plan, with Nate seemingly vulnerable while I kept watch, hidden from sight. As if on cue, the dark figure emerged from the shadows and slowly approached Nate. There was no mistaking it. It was him, the man we had been hunting. My heart raced as I prepared to intervene at just the right moment. One wrong move could cost us everything. As John Doe moved closer to Nate, a shot rang out, and he crumpled to the ground. Leon had been watching too, providing backup from another vantage point. We rushed towards the fallen killer, seeing his lifeless body sprawled on the ground. For a brief moment, relief washed over us, but we knew our work wasn't done yet. The real battle would begin with presenting our findings to law enforcement officers who had previously dismissed our claims and fighting for justice for those who had fallen prey to this monster. In time, we succeeded in bringing John Doe's crimes to light and gain some closure for the families left behind. To honor their memory and ensure that others wouldn't suffer at the hands of such evil predators again, Leon decided to form a private investigation team, enlisting Nate and me to join him. Together, we dedicated ourselves to hunting down the monsters that lurk in the shadows and making sure they face the consequences of their actions. Did you ever stop to think about how quickly things can change? I was driving my truck along Interstate 90 in South Dakota one evening, just humming along as I usually do to keep my sanity during these long hauls. I had stopped earlier at a little roadside diner, where I enjoyed quite possibly the best club sandwich I'd ever eaten. Life felt pretty good during that meal. Little did I know what the night had in store for me. My name is Wilder Hunley, and I've been a trucker for most of my adult life. It's a lonely job, but it can be unusually exciting under the right circumstances. Some of the characters you cross paths with on the highway are worth an evening of storytelling with your buddies at the local bar. But this particular encounter tops them all. Just past midnight, I noticed something unusual through my side mirror, 
a car tailing me pretty closely with its lights off. For whatever reason, it didn't sit right with me. My first thought was that it might be some joker playing games, but as the miles kept ticking away, it became increasingly clear that this wasn't a regular driver looking for cheap thrills. The tension grew in my chest as the car continued to follow me from behind, closing the gap between us faster than any car should on an open highway like this. The low hum of their engine must have been the most sinister sound I'd heard in ages. It was when I saw three men wearing ski masks emerge from the shadows of their darkened car that panic truly set in. As though drilled into action by some military squad leader, they opened fire on my truck without warning, causing glass to shatter and metal to buckle all around. When they pulled even with me and started shooting again, this time into the cab, I knew I had no choice but to surrender or die fighting. The bullets was just inches from my head as I slammed on the brakes. It was like watching time slow down as my rig screeched to a halt, smoke billowing from the tires. The attackers wasted no time, pulling me out of the truck at gunpoint. I prayed it would be all over soon, but the nightmare didn't end there. The masked men shoved me into their car, blindfolded me, and drove me off to some dark, unknown place. They spoke very little, a simple, sit still, or shut up, peppered in with twisted laughter at my pain but expressed cruelty beyond belief with every grunt and blow. Eventually, they brought me to an isolated, abandoned warehouse, where my hands and feet were bound tightly before being strung up by a ceiling beam like a human piñata. They tortured me for hours, using various weapons to inflict pain on my body, mostly baseball bats, crowbars, and switchblades that slashed at my flesh until blood formed rivulets that puddled on the floor below. Just when I thought I wouldn't live to see another day, one of the men received a phone call that signaled their abrupt departure. Miraculously, I was left alive, though beaten within an inch of life, swaying pathetically from that beam. It was days after I had endured that traumatic experience that a buddy of mine explained that he had heard through the grapevine about a particularly sadistic gang targeting truckers in this area. They were called the Roadrunners, and apparently they were after whatever valuable cargo they could find in such large vehicles while also getting their sick kicks from brutalizing drivers like myself. In hindsight, it could have been worse. I survived, managed to return home, and healed in due course, but so many others weren't as lucky. To this day, their leader remains a mystery man, the ghost of my nightmares forever haunting me with perhaps only a first name, Dalton. The thought of what Dalton and his cronies did to others still sends a chill down my spine. But as each painful day turned into a distant, albeit terrible, memory, the thought of revenge grew stronger and stronger, driving me to find those who survived similar ordeals and rise up against our tormentors. We now banded together under one purpose, hunting down the roadrunners and bringing an end to their sadistic reign. Months had gone by since we began our clandestine operation, working tirelessly to gather intelligence on the roadrunners. We sifted through contacts, made risky trades for information, and pushed our limits to conceal our movements from these evil predators who ruled the highways. Slowly but surely, we were beginning to make progress. One of our own, a former police officer named Tom Stanton, had managed to plant an informant within the Roadrunners, which proved invaluable in dismantling their network. As we amassed more information, a plan took shape one that would not only lead to the capture of Dalton and his men but also free other truckers from the torment of ever crossing paths with them. The day finally came when all our hard work and determination culminated in a covert assault on one of their hideouts. We moved in silence under the cover of darkness, 
our nerves on edge but driven by a burning desire for justice that seared our souls like a hot branding iron. When we breached their defenses and took them by surprise, it suddenly became clear. The roadrunners had met their match. Our combined strength caught them off guard and sent them into frantic chaos as they scrambled unsuccessfully to escape or retaliate against us. As we systematically dismantled their operations and destroyed their caches of stolen loot, one by one, each merciless criminal was apprehended until only Dalton remained at large. A manhunt ensued with dogged determination, and eventually, after weeks of tireless searching, he was finally cornered at an abandoned gas station in the middle of nowhere. Standing tall despite his defeat, he smirked as if embracing his fate as we finally pronounced him under arrest. Though it's molded us into battle-hardened warriors filled with pain and hate drawn from our own tragic experiences, this motley crew I call my brothers has proven that even in these dark times, hope can prevail, and come hell or high water, we have each other's backs. Our shared suffering has given us a bond stronger than family. It's given us a purpose, and as our journey continues, we will not rest until the last victim of merciless violence is avenged. Have you ever questioned how much you really know about your neighbors? I never did until that summer night in 2016. I was hauling along the I-80 towards Reno, a monotonous drive I had done countless times before. The sun dipped low, casting an eerie orange glow on the desolate Nevada landscape. I pulled into a rest area near Lovelock. I just needed to stretch my legs and grab some grub before continuing on. That's when I first saw him a lanky and unassuming guy named Edwin Haynes. We grabbed adjacent tables at the small cafe and fell into conversation. He'd just gotten off work and was heading home. In the days that followed, we'd run into each other occasionally, share some small talk, and grab some beers after work. At the time, it seemed like an ordinary friendship was forming. Little did I know how wrong I was. The strangeness began when locals started disappearing. First, it was Dale Gibson, a likable mechanic everyone around town knew. A week later, Nancy Murphy vanished without leaving any trace behind either. Lovelock had always been quiet and safe, but things changed quickly. Folks were shaken up and paranoid, questioning everyone around them. Theories ran wild as whispers of secret cults or even serial killers swept through our small town. Slowly but surely, a dark cloud of fear settled over us all. Edwin remained casual about it all, always reminding me of his alibi. He had been home alone or working during those times. I couldn't help but find it mildly unsettling when he mentioned how easy it would be to dispose of a body in the vast, open desert of Nevada. Days turned into weeks when someone found Nancy Murphy's cell phone in the woods outside of town with blood splatters across its cracked screen. Things were spiraling out of control, but no concrete evidence ever surfaced to link what happened to a single suspect. Meanwhile, I continued to haul goods across the interstate, and my encounters with Edwin were now infrequent. When we did meet, he seemed more distant and anxious as if there was something gnawing at him from within. It all came crashing down when the police unearthed three heavily decomposed bodies in a shallow desert grave near the rest area where Edwin and I had first met. Among them were poor Dale and Nancy. Although Edwin's alibi checked out, something still nagged at me. Maybe it was intuition, or maybe just blind fear but I was becoming convinced that there was more to his story than he let on. That's when I decided to do some digging on my own. 
My first breakthrough came when I realized Edwin had an estranged brother named Mitchell Haynes, who was serving time in California for armed robbery. Suddenly, everything started clicking into place. It turned out Edwin had been working with Mitchell as an accomplice in his crimes during the nights and weekends when he was off work. With each robbery escalating in violence, it dawned on me that Mitchell was likely responsible for the string of disappearances, starting with Dale and Nancy. Things went from horrifying to dangerous when Mitchell broke out of prison and made his way back to Lovelock, fueled by rage against the town he blamed for his imprisonment. Soon enough, the brothers were reunited. A deadly cocktail of criminal minds was back on the loose. I shared my findings with the local authorities and urged them to act immediately as the danger grew more tangible with each passing moment. Within days, an intense manhunt led to a violent standoff between police and the Haynes brothers on a remote desert road. When the dust settled, Mitchell lay dead from multiple gunshot wounds, while Edwin surrendered without incident, but not before confessing to all three murders. The scale of terror inflicted upon our once peaceful community is still unfathomable. As I look back on that harrowing summer in Lovelock, a wave of sadness and confusion washes over me. What did it take for a simple rest stop acquaintance to hold so many nightmarish secrets? The traumatizing events in Lovelock carved deep grooves into the psyches of its inhabitants. Trust had been broken and the once close-knit community now struggled to regain its sense of safety and solidarity. Many families considered moving away, desperate to leave the haunting memories behind and start anew. But for those who chose to stay, it was now a matter of rebuilding and healing. The local authorities organized town hall meetings, grief counseling sessions, and crime watch groups after the Haynes brothers' reign of terror finally came to an end. As weeks rolled by, residents gradually started inching towards normalcy, never forgetting what had transpired but learning to grow from it. I kept traveling the vast interstate for work, constantly reminded of how a seemingly harmless rest stop led me down this winding path of darkness and revelations. But if there was one silver lining in this chilling tale, it's that I now understand the importance of vigilance, not just in protecting myself but in looking out for my neighbor as well. I can still remember the day like it was yesterday despite the fact that it happened years ago. It was a regular Tuesday afternoon, somewhere around 4 p.m., when I pulled into a seemingly ordinary truck stop in a small town just outside Oklahoma City. My name is Leon Kirkwood, and I'm a truck driver by trade. I've been driving big rigs for almost 20 years now. It's been a lonely life, but the road has been my home for as long as I can remember. I entered the truck stop diner wearing my usual weary expression, simply wanting to grab a decent meal before hitting the road again. The waitress, a kind-looking woman named Mabel, seemed genuinely happy to see me, something I'm not always used to. As she was taking my order, that's when I noticed him, Chester Blackwood. He was sitting at the end of the counter, nursing his black coffee and looking like he was waiting for someone. If only I had known then how dangerous those red eyes were. Nothing seemed out of place that afternoon. The diner chattered with steady conversation between truckers swapping tales of their journeys and local folk discussing events in their small town bubble. Little did we know what sinister undercurrent was about to change everything. It wasn't until a woman called out from the ladies' room her voice trembling with fear, that everything took an abrupt turn for the worse. Her name was Carolyn Shaw, and as she stumbled out of the restroom, gripping her bleeding arm tightly with a look of confusion and terror in her eyes, 
we understood something was horribly wrong. In all honesty, I didn't know who Carolyn Shaw was before this day. Turns out she worked at the local bank and would often come to the diner for lunch. Folks here quickly filled me in on her story as we tended to her wound. A maniacal laughter echoed through our ears as we huddled around her while Chester shamelessly sat at the counter, taking another sip of his coffee. The puzzling part was how no one had seen anyone enter or leave the restroom except for Carolyn. It quickly became clear that Chester was involved somehow. The change in atmosphere was sudden. What was once a friendly conversation had shifted into a tense investigation, one where everyone eyed each other with suspicion. Minutes later, two local police officers entered the diner after receiving a call about the disturbance. In an effort to maintain law and order, they started asking questions and were eager to detain Chester as the primary suspect due to his suspicious demeanor. But before they could apprehend him, he leaped over the counter and savagely attacked one of the officers. Pandemonium erupted. Inhuman strength and determination coursed through Chester's veins as he clawed, ripped, and fought his way out of that diner. Customers and officers alike tried to stop him, but it was no use. It seemed as if nothing could bring him down. And just like that, he was gone, bloodied and free, leaving a trail of carnage behind him. It wasn't until days later, after I had left town on my next haul, that I came across a newspaper article detailing Chester Blackwood's past a deeply disturbed individual with a string of violent incidents behind him. Nobody ever deep dug far enough to discover his killing spree going on for years. Only then did everything click into place. That small town bore witness to an evil none of us could have ever imagined, leaving us all haunted by the memories we can never forget. In the aftermath of that horrific day, I couldn't help but feel a strange sense of connection with the small town and its residents. As I continued on my long hauls through various states and roadways, I found myself constantly thinking about the events that had unfolded in front of my eyes. Never before had I cared about a place or its people the way I did with Oklahoma City. Perhaps it was guilt for not being able to do more to prevent Chester from escaping. Or maybe it was simply the realization that even in the smallest corners of the world, unspeakable evil could be lurking. In any case, I felt the responsibility to uncover more about Chester Blackwood's past and bring justice to his countless victims. Years went by, and whenever my route brought me close to Oklahoma City, I made it a point to stop at that very same truck stop diner. The place had changed significantly since that fateful day. Mabel had retired, and a younger couple took over the ownership. They didn't know much about Chester Blackwood or the horrifying incident all those years ago, but they did their best to make sure their establishment remained a safe haven for drivers like myself. In an age where technology dominated most aspects of our lives, I found solace in dusty archives at local libraries and clippings from old newspapers. Piece by piece, I began unraveling the dark history of Chester Blackwood, a seemingly unending litany of violence and bloodshed. It seemed as if fate itself conspired to push me further down this path when a fellow trucker reported sighting Chester on the outskirts of another small town in Nevada. This sparked a renewed sense of purpose within me. As long as Chester remained on the loose, no one was safe from his malevolence. And so it began, an obsession that spanned decades until every waking moment of my life became centered around my pursuit of unmasking Chester Blackwood and bringing him to justice. Little did I know how this quest would change the lives of everyone I encountered along the way, for better or for worse. At times, it felt as if the specter of Chester was haunting my very thoughts. But I knew that I couldn't rest until I had finally put an end to his reign of terror.
I still remember that night as if it were yesterday. February 19, 2004, somewhere between Butte, Montana, and Spokane, Washington I'd been trucking for over a decade by then, and I'd seen my fair share of pretty nasty stuff on the road. So far, nothing had gotten to me quite like that night. My name is Carter Fletch Fletcher. I was raised in a thoroughly blue-collar family in Idaho, and trucking seemed like a natural extension of my dad's work at the local automobile factory. I'd been through some long hauls and weird encounters before this particular night, but nothing stood out as eerie or strange at the time. I pulled up to Rusty's Diner around 7 p.m. The parking lot was nearly empty except for two other trucks, but with those harsh Montana winters, folks usually hunker down somewhere indoors after dark anyway. Getting out of my truck I was greeted by the all-too-familiar scent of cigarettes mixed with the faint aroma of cheap alcohol. As I walked inside the diner, I took my usual spot at the counter near the window. The waitress, a lady seemingly in her mid-forties named Alice, she wore a name tag, otherwise, I wouldn't have known, brought me a coffee without asking. We exchanged a friendly smile before she went back to attending to other customers, Gus and Mikey, the regulars at Rusty's. I took my time with my meal and enjoyed listening to the trio bicker about local sports teams and their lives like they were starring in their own sitcom. It wasn't until close to 9 p.m. that things started spiraling into chaos. It began with an unfamiliar pickup truck skidding into the parking lot. From where I sat, I saw only one silhouette in that truck, a man wearing what seemed like a baseball cap and a glint of metal on his side. The whole atmosphere turned ice cold in an instant. The man entered Rusty's with his face partially covered by a red bandana. His eyes scanned the room, stopping for a moment to look at each one of us. All right, he growled. Everyone drop your wallets and phones into this bag. And you, he pointed to Alice. Empty the till into the bag as well. Gus and Mikey initially refused, demanding he leave or they'd call the police. But the man responded with a swift strike to Gus's face with the butt of his gun, sending him crashing down to the floor. As terrified murmurs filled the room, Alice, trembling, did as she was told while I fumbled to get my wallet out of my pocket. But then Mikey suddenly launched himself at the robber, fingers clawing for the man's face. A gunshot echoed through Rusty's diner, and Mikey fell motionless onto the stained linoleum floor. The survival instinct kicked in. I jumped from my seat and tackled the man from behind. After seemingly endless moments of pure terror that felt like hours, I managed to pin him down until two others came to help restrain him until the police arrived. But as they arrested him and removed his bandana, we didn't recognize him, a stranger shrouded in obsidian mystery. Weeks later, if not months later, after following up on court dates and talking with detectives involved in the case and obsessively wondering why that night happened, why here, the truth finally surfaced from a retired cop nursing a beer at another local dive. Randall McMurphy, the one-time golden boy of our hometown until drugs and shady acquaintances caught up to him, had returned with a vengeance that night. And just let me tell you, no one saw it coming. As much as I'd like to end that chapter in my life for good, that night burned into our town's memory forever, a mark of betrayal and loss. In Rusty's diner, the laughter died as scars ran deep, and as for Randall McMurphy, he, along with his brother's blood-soaked shirt, ended up locked away in prison. Time moved on, and Rusty's diner began to regain its former vibrancy. It seemed as if the entire town had banded together in the aftermath of that fateful night, determined not to let tragedy define them. Gus eventually opened a youth center in Mikey's name, providing a safe haven for the town's young people, 
a place where they could stay away from the darkness that once consumed Randall McMurphy. As for Alice, she bought Rusty's Diner after old Rusty retired and turned it into a thriving spot where locals and travelers alike would gather to share stories and heal. I continued trucking, though with a little more caution and a watchful eye. I came to appreciate the small moments of peace in my travels, the sunrise over the Rockies or a quiet stretch of highway on a moonlit night. Though no amount of distance could erase the memories I had of that night at Rusty's, I found solace in knowing that I had played a part in helping my community stay strong. As years passed and new faces populated that old diner counter, whispers of what happened faded into history. Yet somehow, the lessons learned prevailed, the importance of community strength and resilience in times of turmoil. And every time I'd pull up to Rusty's diner for a cup of coffee and catch sight of Alice smiling behind the counter, I knew deep down that we had all grown stronger because of that night, scarred but never broken. I still remember the day as if it were yesterday. It was October 22, 1999, and I was driving my usual route from Phoenix to Albuquerque. This gig had become my life, driving through the lonely highways of America's Southwest, delivering packages for a small logistics company. My name is Jackson Carmichael, and I'm a truck driver. Little did I know that this seemingly mundane trip would change my life forever. I pulled off the highway at a rest stop about 30 miles outside of Flagstaff for a quick bio break. The place was desolate, just me, my truck, and the cold desert wind blowing tumbleweeds in the orange twilight. As I stepped out of my truck, I noticed an old beat-up pickup parked about 50 yards away. Nothing too unusual. In fact, rather common since we truckers often take breaks there. I befriended another regular whose name, as he once told me over a cigarette break, was Theodore Ted Bylinskas. We developed a sort of camaraderie over time based on our shared love for open road stories and our rebellious natures, which led us to indulge in whiskey shots along with conversations. But it wasn't like Ted to leave his truck unattended like this. There wasn't even a single sign that he had recently been inside it. I tried not to worry too much and walked into the nearby restroom filled with outdated graffiti on its walls. Some were taunts referring to Ted being an alleged serial killer, so typical of truckers' typical crude sense of humor. As I finished up and headed back towards my rig, I couldn't help but glance once more at Ted's abandoned pickup. That's when I heard it, whispers carried by the wind behind me. It's happening again. Shivers raced down my spine when logic hit me. Where could, whispers, have come from, and who might be again? I shook off the discomfort as fatigue played tricks on my mind and clambered back into my truck. Despite the distraction, I still needed to complete my run. As I fastened the seat belt, I made a mental note to bring up Ted's abandoned truck with him next time we met and pulled back onto the highway. The incident wasn't far from my thoughts as I drove into the night. The radio chatter between truckers was scarce, but phrases like, Someone's been messing with us, and I swear to God there's something out here, kept being repeated. The tension was palpable. It made my skin crawl. Everybody seemed on edge. By the time I reached Gallup, New Mexico, I was desperate to believe it was all baseless paranoia. I couldn't silence those whispers, though. Deciding to confide in my only friend in this industry, I pulled up at Ted's usual hangout spot and found him smoking near his pickup. He noticed me staring at it and said, Hey Jackson, you look like you've seen a ghost. Summoning courage that wavered in my voice, I recalled the earlier rest stop encounter. 
Without hesitating further, Ted told me about the mysterious disappearances of fellow truck drivers around that area for the past few months. Some were found brutally mutilated while others never returned. Now that everyone knew something sinister was stalking them, even the authorities had no concrete answers. Drivers began speculating wildly. Could it be a deranged hitchhiker? An ex-trucker seeking revenge? None of these theories calmed our nerves or explained everything going on. Weeks later, even as paranoia took a toll on our sanity, we carried on with our jobs because, well, we had no other option. One fateful night, a transmission crackled through our radios. Jackson. Ted. I found that son of a... The voice belonged to another driver, Bernie Sanchez. And his message cut off abruptly. Ted and I exchanged knowing glances. We couldn't ignore this any longer. We agreed to meet the following day at the rest stop where our nightmare had begun. Ted was agitated as he sifted through printouts of missing person reports and crime scene photos of dead truckers, muttering, These wounds, they don't make sense. The pattern resembles a bear attack, but bears don't wander down here. In that moment, we realized we weren't afraid of some unknown danger lurking in the darkness. We were terrified of the very possibility that this was something beyond our comprehension, something that defied reason and logic. We decided then and there that we needed to take matters into our own hands and figure out the truth behind these horrific events. As days turned to weeks, Ted and I became amateur sleuths, delving deeper into the darkness that had descended on our fellow truckers. Each clue led us further into the unknown as we pieced together a jigsaw puzzle of macabre incidents, bizarre sightings, and chilling eyewitness accounts. Every lead seemed to lead nowhere until one day, during a conversation with an old Navajo woman at a roadside diner, she spoke of legends passed down through generations, legends of shape-shifting beings called skinwalkers that took the forms of animals or humans to prey upon the unsuspecting. The very idea seemed ludicrous, but in our desperation to find answers, we began poring over centuries-old texts and folklore. The more we uncovered, the more the impossible seemed probable. Bit by bit, the mythic pieces fell into place, fitting chillingly with what was happening around us. And as we sat in a dusty library late one night, poring over the ancient writings, it dawned on us that our quest for answers had led us on an ominous path. For now we too were potential targets of this malevolent force stalking our highways. The realization was sobering. Ted and I had unwittingly become both hunters and hunted in this deadly game. But there was no turning back. We were in too deep. Our only chance was to confront the evil head-on, armed with whatever knowledge and courage we had managed to muster. As we set out on our final journey together toward an uncertain destiny, I couldn't help but think back on my mundane life before all this began and how insignificant it now seemed compared to the terrifying reality we were about to face. It was a moment where fate had unwittingly pulled us from obscurity and, in its unyielding grasp, forced us down a harrowing path from which there was no return. It was just another night on the road, hauling cargo from Texas to New Mexico along an isolated stretch of Highway 67. My name is Aldrin Santolano, and I've spent most of my adult life behind the wheel of a truck. The quiet thrum of the engine was soothing, and as much as the endless miles sometimes blurred together, this drive felt uneasy. I'd stop for a meal in a small diner just outside of Marfa, where a group of locals exchanged hushed conversation. Never one to pry, I simply ate my food and listened in, more out of boredom than interest. 
They discuss the rash increase in unsolved disappearances throughout their community, attributing the cases to some mysterious drifter no one knew much about. A few hours later, I stopped at a rest area to stretch my legs. That's when I saw her, a hollow-eyed woman sitting on a bench with tattered clothes and unkempt hair. Deciding to be kind, I offered her some water and asked if she was okay. She looked at me with fear dancing across her face and muttered something under her breath about the shadows that creep. Assuming she was just in a rough patch, I kept our interaction brief and got back on the road, promising myself I'd call the local authorities once I reached my destination. Halfway there, though, my trip took an unexpected turn. My rig suddenly hit something massive, an unexpected obstacle right in the middle of the highway. Brake lights flashed as panic screeches filled my ears. Chaos unfolded around me, cars swerving off the road under unseen forces, their drivers frantic with no escape from what seemed like an invisible predator. As bystanders were dragged into thickets by dark tendrils that materialized from nowhere, my heart raced while adrenaline pumped through my veins. Realizing that standing still would make me easy prey, I threw my truck into the closest gear and took off down the highway, trying to outrun whatever was hunting us all. The disruption was relentless. More shadows began appearing on my windshield, contorting and pushing through the glass. I fought to keep the truck under control as I maneuvered around debris littered along the road. The ghostly whispers of fallen strangers filled my head, urging me to give in and join them in their unknown fate. But I refused, pressing ahead as fear drove me forward. Barely able to stay focused on the road ahead, an eighteen-wheeler appeared in my rearview mirror, barreling down on me with aggressive speed. I recognized its red and black paint job, a fellow trucker named Earl Montenegro, a heavy-set man with an easy laugh whom I'd shared many coffees with at various truck stops. His gravelly voice echoed through the cab's radio. Aldrin! You got company? Earl? I choked out in disbelief. How did you find me? As our vehicles closed in on one another, Earl recounted how he noticed my rig swerving erratically on his way back home after hearing chatter over police scanners detailing our dire situation. He'd approached cautiously but was determined to lend a hand. Together, we navigated the treacherous landscape ahead. Soon the chaos subsided, and we pulled over into an abandoned gas station for a brief respite from the terror that had haunted our every turn. Exhausted and terrified, Earl revealed what he'd uncovered, an underground internet rumor of a man named Vernon Casterlane wandering from town to town and committing acts of unspeakable violence, previously only whispered about in the darkened corners of local forums. With no time to contemplate our next move, we were beset once more by the encroaching darkness. We survived that night by sheer determination and luck eventually putting enough distance between ourselves and the malevolent force that pursued us. It's been months, but the horrifying events of that night are still fresh in my memory. Vernon Casterlane remains a mystery, a name we carry in hushed conversations and a dread that settles in the pit of our stomachs every time we set out on another lonely stretch of road. The shadows may still be lurking, and who knows whether our paths will ever cross again. I hope they never do. In the months since that harrowing night, Earl and I have become almost inseparable on the road. Each time we set out for another long haul, a tense awareness of our surroundings occupies us. Through mutual understanding, we've stocked our trucks with emergency supplies, simple things like extra water and sturdy cables for towing along with barriers to shield us from harm should those unnatural shadows attempt to confront us again. We try our best to act as if everything is back to normal in our daily lives, but that constant nagging fear, the notion that somewhere behind us, Vernon Casterlane is still on the prowl, 
prevents us from truly embracing the tranquility of life before the nightmare. Wordlessly, we acknowledge this shared pain as it lingers beneath casual conversation and clings to us like smog obscuring a skyline. More and more, we start seeking out fellow truckers faced with similar experiences or haunted by the unexplained, seeking reassurance in numbers or perhaps hoping to uncover clues about our elusive and terrifying adversary, Vernon Casterlane. Our covert network grows alongside whispered rumors, pooling together stories of near misses and harrowing encounters to create a hidden fraternity forged in fear. The stretches of highway feel a little less isolated knowing there's a community looking out for one another. And who knows, maybe someday we might unravel enough truths to finally confront Vernon Casterlane himself, freeing us all from the mortifying shadows threatening our very existence on those lonely stretches of road. Have you ever wondered how a seemingly ordinary night could spiral into your worst nightmare? That's exactly what happened to me one fateful evening in a small town in Tennessee. It was a little after midnight when I stopped my truck to refuel at an isolated gas station. The eerie silence was almost unsettling. As a truck driver, I've seen countless places like this but something about it made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. It was just too quiet. My name is Landon Brackenridge, by the way, and before all this madness happened, I was just your average guy who happened to drive an 18-wheeler coast-to-coast for a living. Life was simple, more or less. As I filled up my truck, I spotted another person across the street under a flickering streetlight. He didn't seem threatening, just a regular man with dark hair, standing next to his car, trying to change a flat tire. But despite everything appearing normal, something in my gut told me there was more behind this unremarkable encounter. I don't usually engage with strangers late at night, but curiosity got the better of me as I crossed over to lend him a hand. When I got closer though, his face seemed unusually tense and sweaty, like he'd been through hell and back. It took you long enough, he grumbled at me. His tone had instant hostility, weird considering we'd never met before. Sorry. I feigned confusion but nevertheless reached down to help him with the tire just the same. Then suddenly, from behind an abandoned building, emerged seven more guys, their faces obscured by ski masks and armed with baseball bats. My heart started pounding through my chest as they motioned us both toward the dark alley nearby. Glancing over at the man who had trapped me in this dangerous situation, I noticed the sweat on his forehead as he flashed me an apologetic look. Turns out, he was just as much a victim as I was trapped by these thugs who had threatened him and held his family hostage if he didn't lure me in. The dark-clad group led us into an old warehouse. The place reeked of decay and dread, and I braced myself for the worst. As we stepped deeper inside, one of them began peppering us with questions about drug shipments and undercover cops, subjects we knew nothing about. As things escalated, the masked men started to argue among themselves about what would happen next. In a split second, that man named Brendan, as I later learned from our short, desperate conversation, tackled one of our captors, throwing the scene into chaos. I quickly seized the opportunity, aiming at the leg of another attacker with a well-placed kick. The room became a frenzy of shouted curses and swinging bats. Brendan and I fought fiercely, not for vengeance or some sense of heroism, but for our lives. In the end, we miraculously managed to emerge as victors in the brutal encounter, rendering our attackers unconscious, injured, or too frightened to continue their assault. Panting and bruised, we limped away from that blood-soaked warehouse into the night. 
Days passed after that harrowing experience before I learned from a local contact about this cunningly dangerous man named Desmond Oric, apparently our ringleader that night. He'd been running a complex crime operation involving narcotics, human trafficking, and multiple murders for years throughout several states until his most recent criminal endeavors went awry. It seemed we just got caught up in things after being mistaken for some police informants. But just like that night at the warehouse, Desmond slipped through any attempts at apprehending him. With no definitive proof or answer behind his true identity or motives, he simply vanished like smoke after fire. Our lives, however, would never be the same again, forever marked by the darkness hidden within every corner and the gripping fear that Desmond Oric and his twisted schemes could someday reappear. Months turned into years after that horrifying incident, and the memory never left me or Brendan. We stayed in touch, connected by the haunting shared experience that had shaped our lives so unexpectedly. Though the fear of Desmond Oric and his criminal associates persisted, it was time to start rebuilding after the traumatic encounter. I continued with truck driving, no longer considering it a simple job but rather a lifeline that kept me moving forward, always watching for danger lurking around the next bend. Brendan found solace in a support group for survivors of violence, something he recommended for me as well, but I couldn't muster up the courage to dig up the nightmares buried deep beneath my stoic facade. Despite our individual efforts to move on, it was clear that life would never truly return to what it was before that chilling night in Tennessee. An ever-present air of unease followed us like shadows on a cloudy day, fear masked by forced normalcy for the sake of sanity. But we tried our best to find happiness and safety in the small comforts of daily life, therapy sessions, and the ever-strengthening brotherhood born out of adversity. Then one day, while finishing a long haul in New Mexico, I received an unexpected call from Brendan, his voice shaking with panic as he delivered horrifying news. Desmond Oric had been spotted in nearby El Paso. It was uncertain what he was planning, but rumors within law enforcement circles suspected his reemergence signaled the start of something far worse than anything we'd previously faced. The dreadful realization came crashing down. We were not done with our haunted past. Instead, it seemed destined to consume us until there was nowhere left to run or hide. With only each other to rely on and taking matters into their own hands, Landon and Brendan decided to do what no one else had been able to do, hunt down Desmond Oric and put an end to his reign of terror once and for all. As they embarked on this perilous undertaking, the line between heroes and enemies blurred, and the two men found themselves unwittingly unraveling a conspiracy that ran far deeper than they could have ever imagined. The road to justice was fraught with danger, secrets, and tormented souls, but ultimately, it would lead to a final confrontation with the devil himself, Desmond Oric. And this time, only one party would walk away alive. It was just another night on the road. I was hauling a load of electronics from California to Nevada, cruising down a two-lane highway in my old Ford rig. I stopped at a dingy truck stop somewhere outside of Vegas called Mixer's Corner. It wasn't much to look at, but all I needed was some hot coffee and a quick bite to eat. I'm Jake Salinger, by the way. I've been a truck driver for over 20 years now. It's a lonely job, but it suits me well enough. That night, as I bit into my greasy burger, something fell off. I noticed the waitress, an older woman with frizzy gray hair, keep peering anxiously out the window. The couple in the corner booth seemed tense, arguing about something under their breaths. 
The jukebox switched to a familiar tune, and the uneasy feeling crept further up my spine. Some instinct told me to pay and get back on the road, but then he walked through the door, an unassuming man in his late thirties with thinning hair and cold blue eyes. He sent chills down my spine just by scanning the room. His gaze locked on mine for a moment before he turned his attention to the order counter. As the minutes ticked by, he struck up a conversation with Travis, the scruffy-looking bartender who'd been a fixture at this place for years. They seemed friendly enough on the surface, but I swear I saw something sinister flicker in that guy's eyes. My coffee and burger forgotten, my curiosity got the better of me when they both headed out back for a smoke break. What happened next still haunts me. Peering cautiously around the corner of the building, I witnessed Travis being violently attacked by this stranger who just shared a cigarette with him. He used every weapon available, fists, boots, even broken glass from a beer bottle. Horrified, my instincts screamed at me to run and call the police. But an icy fear held me in place, just out of their sight. It wasn't until I saw streaks of blood splattered across the attacker's face that I knew I had to do something, anything, before he killed Travis. With all my strength, I charged forward and slammed into the assailant with the force of a freight train. We toppled to the ground, and Jake and his murderous rage locked into a desperate struggle for survival. Luckily, my training in boxing during high school came back to me like lightning. Finally, I managed to knock him out cold, tie him up with rope from my rig, and call for help. The police arrived shortly after. Sirens filled the air, and patrons looked on as we recounted what happened, their disbelief palpable. Days later, when local news reported about the arrest of infamous serial killer Andrew Moore, responsible for multiple gruesome murders across the tri-state area, it hit me that I'd inadvertently saved not just Travis but countless others. Apparently, Moore had befriended Travis to gain information about potential victims at truck stops along his routes. Somehow this monster had slipped under everyone's radar for years. To this day, Sleep doesn't come easy, but sometimes fate puts us where we need to be when we least expect it, guiding our hands and leading us down a road towards chance encounters that change our lives forever. After that fateful night, things haven't been the same. People around town were whispering, and I could feel their eyes on me, the truck driver who took down a serial killer. It's strange to think about how that once ordinary night transformed me into a local hero. Fame wasn't something I ever wanted, but it was a byproduct of doing the right thing. The repercussions of that encounter extended beyond the boundaries of truck stop conversations and reached my family, who were worried about my safety, and many friends who hadn't reached out in years suddenly appeared for a chat. The experience opened my eyes to our interconnectedness, strangers from all walks of life linked through some unseen force when fate steps in. Even the solitary profession of driving across America's roadways held its share of unexpected twists and turns. It also taught me to look out for my fellow travelers on life's highways a little more closely and forge connections with people I might not have otherwise. From that point forward, Life became less isolated. Every stop was no longer just another pit stop but an opportunity for new friendships or encounters sprung from the invisible threads of destiny. The world felt different, vast yet connected in its infinite possibilities, unpredictable occurrences mending the cracks in our lives and sometimes making heroes out of those who least expected it. I was sipping my lukewarm coffee just past midnight at Mike's roadside diner off Interstate 80. It was late September, the kind of night when the shadows were longer, 
and a chill seeped into the bones. My name's Caden Braxley, and I've been a truck driver for 13 years, long enough to know that there are things in this world I can't fully comprehend. It all started when I noticed Jamie Locke from across the diner. I'd passed her on a few routes before. That trademark bright yellow freight liner of hers was hard to miss. Jamie had a carefree air about her. A rebellious streak marked our conversations as short and sarcastic, but always filled with laughter. So, Braxley, she said after exchanging pleasantries, I keep hearing about this infamous Route 50 in Nevada. People call it the loneliest road in America. Have you ever taken it? I frowned. Once or twice, but there ain't much to see there. Jamie's eyes gleamed with curiosity. Come on, don't you get bored with the same old scenery? Let's make things interesting. An hour later, we found ourselves nearing Route 50 under that haunting moonlit sky. To break the monotony, we tuned into local radio stations airing strange stories about odd happenings in abandoned settlements along the highway. Then suddenly, Jamie's voice crackled through my radio, a mix of confusion and terror lacing her tone. Caden, there's a... Uh, I think you need to see this. Right as she spoke those words, the radio cut to static. Concerned but hesitant to let paranoia settle in, I guided my truck off the main road, following her taillights up ahead. Eventually, we arrived at a decrepit gas station surrounded by the remnants of a crumbling town. I parked my truck and jumped out, uncertainty hanging heavy in the air. An eerie sight greeted me. Jamie stood statue-like, fixated on something that made my hair stand on end tracks leading in and out of the gas station culminating in splatters of dried blood that stained the pavement. Jamie, I... What the hell were you thinking? Before she could answer, a faint whimper echoed from behind the station, sending our eyes darting to its source. We moved cautiously, only to find a man beaten beyond recognition. With a barely audible voice, he whispered a single name, Terence. How he managed to give us any information baffled us. Grabbing our hands, he pleaded with us to find his daughter Lily. She had been taken by a man named Terence. Jamie and I locked eyes, realizing we couldn't just walk away from this situation. Following the faintest of clues and whispers throughout that abandoned town, we found ourselves in a nightmarish cat and mouse game with a ruthless predator a human capable of monstrous deeds. He taunted us at every turn. It seemed he was always one step ahead. Our adrenaline surged as we uncovered grisly signs of his depraved acts within isolated farmhouses and forgotten homesteads. A bloody stain here, an ominous message there. After hours of pursuit and many close calls, we finally stumbled upon him by sheer luck, or perhaps misfortune. Exhausted but determined to save little Lily from imminent doom, we restrained Terence in desperation after an intense struggle that left Jamie badly injured and me scarred near my eye. Once we secured Lily's safe return to her surviving family members further down Route 50, authorities arrived to take care of Terence. As this happened, we learned about his dark history as an escaped prisoner who'd been preying on unsuspecting travelers for years. In my many years on the road, I thought I'd seen it all. But that chilling encounter on the infamous loneliest road in America would haunt me forever. As Jamie and I finally parted ways, we silently vowed never to set foot on Route 50 again. Months later, we found ourselves crossing paths once more, but something had changed between us. Those harrowing events on Route 50 unearthed a bond forged from our shared experience, a mutual understanding of living life profoundly altered. We became each other's confidants, discussing the oddities we'd come across and the darkness we couldn't quite shake off. 
We were no longer just acquaintances passing each other by but rather traveling companions with a deep sense of connection. Over countless cups of truck stop coffee in diner booths and under moonlit skies our laughter returned, albeit tinged with an undercurrent of sorrow. It was as if we carried a secret only the two of us could know or understand. And with each mile traveled on those endless highways stretching across America, our supportive friendship morphed into something deeper. It became a beacon of hope that pierced through the fog of loneliness, forever altering our journey as truck drivers and as humans navigating our way through this world's uncharted territories. It all began on a typical day when I was driving my big rig through the winding roads of West Virginia. I was making a delivery, and my truck was humming smoothly along the highway, following the curve of the river that ran parallel. This route wasn't new to me, but something felt off that day. I just couldn't put my finger on it. My name is Jed Latimer. I come from a long line of truck drivers and have been doing it pretty much all my life. Dad always said it was in our blood. We love the open road and the feel of a roaring engine beneath us more than anything else. Anyway, back to that eerie day. As the sun began to set behind the mountains, I found myself stopping for a quick break at a local gas station called Old Dixie's. It was nothing special. Just your regular pit stop with snacks, gas, and some trucker supplies. But it had charm. Everyone knew each other around these parts. While filling up on diesel, I noticed an old-timer named Tom striking up a conversation with another driver near me. I couldn't make out most of what they were saying, but one thing caught my attention. Something about recent disappearances in the area. Anyway... After fueling up and grabbing some grub for the road, I took off towards Interstate 64, hoping to get another 200 miles in before calling it a night. A few hours later, I noticed headlights racing up behind me, so I switched lanes, hoping to let them pass, only for them to follow suit. My gut started churning, and just as I was going to call it in on my CB radio, I remembered those weird disappearances mentioned earlier. I pressed hard on the gas but couldn't seem to shake them off. Red flags blared in my mind. This vehicle's behavior seemed far from normal. Moments later, they sped up and started driving erratically around me, sometimes getting uncomfortably close. I had no idea who or what they were, but the intent was clear as day, harm. In a moment of panic, I jerked the steering wheel, hoping they'd back off, but it only made them more aggressive. Another trucker soon appeared in my rearview mirror and started communicating over the CB radio with me, asking if I was alright. Jed here. I've got this crazy driver harassing me. I quickly replied, leaving out the part about disappearing folks I'd overheard earlier. The other driver didn't take long to respond. This is Carl. I heard some chatter at Old Dixie's earlier, sounding like we've got another incident on our hands, buddy. Stay alert and try to pull over at the next stop. We'll deal with it together. Agreeing, I pressed on until we reached a rest area where Carl and I could meet face to face. As we stepped out of our rigs, the mysterious vehicle finally sped off into the night without so much as a trace. Carl and I exchanged our experiences and concerns. The antagonist, Aura, still lingered. Weeks later, after making my delivery and arriving back home, Carl called me up to update me on what he'd found out from some local sources. Turns out those disappearances were indeed connected to a serial killer forcing truckers off the road and preying upon them under cover of darkness. As for his identity? No one knew, 
but damn did it make my skin crawl for weeks after. Today, while they still haven't caught him, we lock our doors a little tighter in West Virginia's shadows, knowing he's still out there somewhere stalking his unwitting prey like that eerie night while cruising through mountainsides against the setting sun. Years have passed since that harrowing experience, but it has left a lasting impact on the trucking community. Truckers who frequent those desolate West Virginia roads have become more wary and alert, always checking their surroundings and never traveling alone whenever possible. A strong sense of unity has developed amongst us, we are in constant communication with one another through various channels using our CB radios, sharing news, information, and tips to keep everyone as informed and safe as possible. Truck stops have grown busier in the late hours as drivers now travel in groups for extra protection. People have taken it upon themselves to spread awareness about the still active serial killer haunting our highways advising fellow truckers to exercise caution and vigilance. Local law enforcement agencies have also stepped up their efforts in attempting to apprehend the elusive culprit. Checkpoints have become more frequent along the highways, and officers patrol rest stops at night to ensure the safety of drivers. Despite these efforts, however, the perpetrator seems to always be one step ahead, slipping through the cracks like a shadowy phantom. The mystery of his identity remains unsolved. As for me, my life as a trucker continued its course after that close encounter, but I couldn't help but feel forever changed by it. My perspective shifted, a newfound appreciation for life and its fleeting nature took hold within me. I became more conscious of my surroundings while on the road and found solace in the camaraderie that had been strengthened by such grim events amongst my fellow truckers. We continued to watch each other's backs and lend a helping hand whenever needed because we all know too well that there lies an unseen predator amidst those familiar routes and picturesque landscapes, reminding us that danger often lurks where we least expect it. It all began on one of my usual routes, hauling cargo through some forgotten stretch of interstate. I'm just a truck driver, you know, with a bunch of years under my belt. My name is Rutherford Quinley, and I've been in this business long enough to know that it ain't so much the destination as the journey. But this particular night, there's something about the air. One of those eerie moments that sort of lingers between your ribs like a nagging cough. In times like this, you can almost feel something sinister just out of sight. I had stopped at this out-of-the-way truck stop called The Last Stand. The waitress, Alice Maybelline, served me a plate of overcooked eggs and some burnt toast as Reginald Hardy shared stories with other drivers about jobs gone wrong and deals gone sour. One moment we're laughing, the next moment we find ourselves swapping experiences about unexplained occurrences and bizarre encounters on the open road. I remember looking over toward Tabitha Swanson, sitting in the corner booth. She seemed as uneasy as I felt. About an hour into my journey back on the road, I noticed that my gas was already running low a baffling issue considering I'd filled up before leaving the truck stop. Cursing under my breath, I begrudgingly decided to find an exit and search for a filling station. The fact that it was now pushing past midnight didn't help one bit. Taking the exit off the freeway got me stranded in some godforsaken part of Nowheresville, USA. Houses were scarce among the vast stretches of farmlands that seemed more abandoned than worn from hard work. Somehow, each mile felt like it had swallowed me deeper into isolation. Then suddenly, out by a sun-scorched grain silo lofting overhead like some forgotten sentinel, an animal darted into the road, only to drop dead from the cruelest of head injuries right as it made eye contact with my headlights. 
For a moment, my pulse hammered like bongos. I kept driving. You never know who, or what, is lurking in the shadows. But whatever was going on, one fact was plain as day. I needed fuel, or else I'd be stranded with whatever darkness eyed me out here. Soon after, I arrived at an old filling station that looked like it hadn't seen any business since the turn of the century. As I stepped out of the truck, I noticed graffiti-covered walls that seemed to conceal some terrible secrets beneath layers of faded, chipped paint. It was then that I saw her again, Tabitha Swanson. Tabitha? What the hell are you doing out here? I asked warily. Don't tell me you got stranded too. She glanced around nervously and whispered. We need to leave this place now. Her desperation and terror were undeniably contagious. If not for the promise of fuel at this dying relic, we might have bolted without a second thought. I don't know what's going on here. She confided when we retreated to the safety of my truck cabin. But there's someone here stalking me ever since I left the last stand. She described how just hours earlier, she'd found scratches along her car's exterior and discovered her brakes weren't working properly, a sabotage attempt made evident by fresh human fingerprints left alongside the telltale markings of a monkey wrench. Then we realized just how far from coincidence these events had strayed. As our nerves tightened like hangman's nooses and our eyes darted across lonely fields hidden beneath a moonlit gauze, something slowly became apparent. We were caught in an intricate game against an unknown opponent who sought us out as playthings. Their motives were as opaque as their movements. Through all the chaos, a single image imprinted itself in my mind, Jesse McGinnis. He was always hanging around the darker corners of the last stand, sipping away at his whiskey as he muttered to himself. Or even how Alice Maybelline's eyes lingered on mine just a moment too long. Every twitch and misstep in our synthesized paranoia painted every suspect with malicious intent. Despite everything, we somehow managed to stick together, weaving through harrowing encounters that pushed our bodies and minds to breaking points. It felt like we were inching towards some finale of merciless brutality orchestrated by a person or persons unknown, awakening only after blood had drenched the earth beneath our feet. Every time we dared hope for escape or reprieve, new horrors would emerge from the shadows, their teeth glistening in anticipation of feasting upon our fear. Only through sheer determination and willpower were Tabitha and I able to fend off these threats, each more formidable than the last. As the sun began to crawl over the horizon, its light chasing away the last vestiges of darkness, we stumbled upon the long-abandoned ruins of an old church. It was within these crumbling walls that we found clues pointing to one final showdown, with the mastermind behind our nightmarish ordeal lurking beyond those sacred doors. As we stepped cautiously inside, a chill ran down my spine. The air was heavy with a sense of dread that seemed almost tangible. The flicker of candlelight threw shadows across an altar at the other end of the church, illuminating a figure draped in darkness. As our eyes adjusted to the gloom, the sinister face of Jesse McGinnis emerged from the shadows, his sinister grin serving as a prelude to his twisted revelations. Everything had been meticulously planned. Each near-miss and harrowing chase was an orchestrated symphony of terror designed to toy with us before our eventual downfall. But Tabitha and I refused to give in, drawing on reserves of strength that either of us knew we possessed. Together, we confronted Jesse, bringing his twisted game crashing down around him as we fought for our lives. It was only as he lay defeated at our feet and the nightmare began fading into memory, that we finally understood how our collective fortitude alone had carried us through an insurmountable hell. In the days that followed, as Tabitha and I went our separate ways, I knew I would never forget that one fateful night when darkness came for us both, 
a darkness we faced head-on and triumphed over through courage and unity. And as I continued my journeys along the open road, the memories of those events ever-present in my mind, I promised myself one thing, I would remain vigilant, always keeping an eye on those mysterious shadows, for you never know what malevolence might still lurk within. I was driving my big rig along the winding backroads of southwestern Virginia, somewhere between Roanoke and the North Carolina border. It was nearly midnight, and my eyes were heavy from hours behind the wheel. The darkness outside was thick, punctuated only by the occasional glimmer of distant headlights in the mist. My name is Jefferson Barnaby, but everyone calls me Jeff. I've been a truck driver for 15 years now. It's not everyone's idea of a good time, but it's how I make my living, and I'm damn good at it. There's an isolated truck stop in this area that I frequent. The best pancakes around and a spot to rest before continuing my journey upon arrival. I noticed a group of bikers huddled around their bikes in the parking lot. It was unusual to see them here even rarer at this hour. Inside, I took a seat at the counter next to another driver named Frank Crenshaw. We knew each other well. He drove for a rival company on the same routes as me. Our conversations were casual, trucks, sports, family life. He leaned over and said with a concerned tone, Hey Jeff, did you hear about that string of disappearances? happening out here on these very roads. Yeah, I replied skeptically. I heard rumors but thought it was just small town fearmongering. Nah, he insisted. My cousin Melinda, who works as a state trooper out here, says they've got concrete evidence. Someone or something is taking people right off the road. In retrospect, during our conversation about lost highway travelers and mounting speculations about what could be behind it all, we never considered that we might become victims ourselves. After fueling up on grub and camaraderie at the counter, we parted ways amidst obligatory, be safe, quips. The final irony hung thickly in the air, heavy with tired hope and hidden dread. Returning to my truck, I failed to notice the bikers had disappeared. Back on the road, I struggled to keep my eyes open. The rain intensified, battering my windshield with increasing ferocity while the darkness around me seemed to close and even tighter. Several miles outside that truck stop, I saw headlights approaching at high speed from the rear. The vehicle sped past me on a stretch of straight road and slammed its brakes just ahead of my truck. Gripping the wheel tight, I maneuvered left just enough to avoid a collision and glimpsed the occupants, rugged bikers with scowling faces. They began a relentless pursuit, shooting out of their windows at random passing vehicles. Then those sights turned on me. My adrenaline surged as potential reasons for their rage swirled in panic through my mind like ink in water. Were they the same bikers from before? What could possibly be motivating this deadly game? Was it the sheer will of chaos or something darker? Windshield shattered by flying bullets, glass raking across my face like an icy deluge. As it cleared, another semi roared hard on our heels none other than Frank Crenshaw, coming to the rescue with his rig like a rampaging lion. Frank called me over the CB radio. Jeff! Listen up! Amelia Springs said these bikers had terrorized travelers in nearby towns for months. We're caught in the middle now, but rest assured, we're taking them down together. The realization settled in. Whatever dark secret lurked beneath Vernon County was starting to surface through these bikers' sinister intentions, but neither the linking idea nor the immediate next step could be grasped through the haze of blood-fogged survival instinct. 
We fought back, managing to force the last remaining biker off an embankment before staggering exhaustion took us both down for long overdue sleep in our cabs. It was weeks later when we discovered the true motive behind the bikers. Their malicious leader was named Travis Levine, a calculating man-man determined to create havoc and misery for his own sadistic pleasure. His twisted endgame was finally revealed as the bodies of those long-lost travelers turned up, discarded along the highways where they'd once been so full of hope and purpose. We had witnessed firsthand the depths of human depravity. Jeff and Frank, once mundane truck drivers, are now transformed into unwitting heroes, the protagonists in a chilling true crime tale that will never be forgotten by anyone living among those same haunted roads on which it all transpired. In the aftermath of this harrowing experience, life seemed to change for both Jeff and Frank. The haunting memories of the sinister events served as a constant reminder of how close they had come to being yet another set of forgotten souls on those lonely highways. The chilling tale soon circulated through the trucking community, reinforcing the pair's status as reluctant heroes. It was a bond that neither time nor distance could dilute. Faced with an understanding of this tribe suffering the same dread we had suffered, banded together by shared experience, they found solace in their ability to unite and protect one another. In their gripsly unity, a forbidden strength they vowed never to lose. Over time, news about the ordeal reached state police, who commended both Jeff and Frank for their bravery, presenting them with citations for their uncommon valor. Soon after that fateful night, local truckers and travelers alike established annual gatherings to pay tribute to those innocent victims of Travis Levine's twisted games and honor the bravery exhibited by two steadfast truckers. These gatherings also served as an opportunity for everyone to remain vigilant, constantly reminding them that beneath the seemingly placid surface of rural America can lurk dangerous and sometimes devastating secrets. As for Jeff and Frank, they both continued their truck driving careers, drawing upon a newfound camaraderie that was stronger than ever. Each mile driven was a testament to their strength, a middle finger raised defiantly at the fear that would have them cower before mere nightmares. They carried on with newfound purpose, knowing that there was still goodness in humanity to be preserved amidst the darkest corners something many thought lost forever on these haunted roads that etched paths through their shared history. Why did I even take this route? That was the question buzzing through my head as I guided my truck through the winding roads of the Sierra Nevada mountains. My name is Logan Owens, by the way, and I'm a truck driver. I've been hauling goods across this great nation for nearly 10 years now, and I thought I'd seen it all. A bit about me, born and raised in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I left home to explore the country and make a living on the open road. It has its ups and downs, but one thing's for sure, life's never dull behind the wheel of an 18-wheeler. It was getting late that evening when I pulled into a rest stop just off Highway 395 to catch some sleep. My usual routine is to grab a bite to eat, refuel, and call my wife before turning in for the night. Some other drivers were there as well. Hey Logan! shouted Byron. I'd met him a few times at different stops along our routes. We got to know each other somewhat trading driving stories and griping about our bosses. After our meal, we were all standing around talking, just like any other night. But then Byron told us about some recent murders in the area. Bodies mutilated beyond recognition, no pattern, no leads, just bizarre violence plaguing this specific region the conversation shifted when Dane, another regular trucker buddy of mine, chimed in. 
He mentioned an odd encounter with a man at a nearby convenience store just yesterday. The guy appeared twitchy and kept his face concealed under a hoodie and baseball cap. But Dane couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about him. He looked slippery, almost like he was planning something, Dane said while rubbing his stubbled chin. The conversations tapered off as we returned to our trucks, each of us lost in our own thoughts about those murders Dane mentioned earlier. The next morning, I hit the road with a sense of unease. Climbing back up the mountain, something caught my eye in my rearview mirror, a truck following uncomfortably close behind me. The driver's face was barely visible under a hoodie and baseball cap. Was this the same guy Dane had seen? It couldn't be, I told myself. Descending the mountain, the pickup began tailgating me even more aggressively. Unable to shake him, I pulled off the highway into an abandoned gas station, hoping he would keep going. The pickup pulled in behind me and stopped. My nerves shot through the roof as I gripped the steering wheel tightly. The man stepped out and started casually walking towards my truck. Hey, you got a problem? I yelled through my window, trying to hide the fear in my voice. Nah, I just thought it'd be nice to chat, he replied with a sinister grin. Without warning, he pulled a knife and lunged at me, only missing because I managed to slam my door shut just in time. My heart raced as I locked all doors, dialed 911, and sped away, panicked and irrationally fearful that he would somehow anticipate where I was going. Days later, while recovering in a motel off Highway 1, Byron called me to talk about those recent murders. They had finally identified the killer. As we spoke on the phone, my blood chilled. He was describing the man at that gas station. His name remains unknown even to this day, forever an enigmatic figure of terror lurking somewhere deep within those Sierra Nevada woods, ready to strike again. It took a long time for me to move past that harrowing experience in the Sierra Nevada mountains. My days on the road seemed heavier, and every secluded rest stop or unfamiliar face stirred anxiety in my heart. My wife, sensing my distress, encouraged me to join a support group for truckers who'd encountered violence while on the job. Reluctantly, I attended the meetings and found comfort among other drivers with similar stories. Camaraderie forged through shared fears and understanding. Over time, the memories and the nightmares began to fade, and I found renewed strength in being able to face the open road again. But even as life went on and my nerves calmed, those mountains always cast a dark shadow over my soul. Though thousands of miles may separate me from their treacherous roads, I know that as long as the unknown man remains at large, that sense of lurking danger will never quite disappear. Why is it that the most horrifying experiences always seem to come out of nowhere? That's how it was for me, at least. One moment, I'm cruising along Highway 50 in Nevada, a long-haul truck driver just doing his job, and the next, well, let me start from the beginning. My name is Atlas Greystone, a bit unusual, I know. But my folks came from a long line of travelers and explorers so I think they wanted to pass on that spirit of adventure. I've been driving trucks for years now, hauling goods all across the country. People tend to look down on us truckers, thinking we're simpletons or something. But to be honest, this job made me smarter than ever before, because, let's face it, when you spend countless hours alone with your thoughts, you tend to learn a lot about yourself and the world. I'd be lying if I said I didn't have some creepy encounters along the way. You'd be surprised at the strange characters you'd meet during those late-night pit stops on isolated stretches of highway. 
but nothing could have prepared me for what went down on this particular run through Nevada. It started off as a typical delivery. I had to haul some medical supplies from Salt Lake City to Sacramento. Not much excitement there. My co-driver, Dave, hung out in the sleeper cab while I took my eight-hour shift behind the wheel. We were just crossing over from Utah into Nevada when we decided to stop for some grub. We knew a nice little 24-hour diner near Ely called. The Silver Spoon. Seemed innocuous enough. Probably hundreds like them scattered throughout this great nation. At first glance, everything seemed normal inside the Silver Spoon. The usual cast of characters filled the joint. Truckers fueling up on caffeine and hash browns. Exhausted night shift workers seeking quick comfort food fixes and a few scattered locals having their pre-dawn coffees. I hadn't even finished my first cup of coffee when I noticed him, an unkempt man who looked like he hadn't slept in days. Something about the guy put me on edge, even though his actions weren't inherently sinister. He paid for his meal, quietly chatting with the waitress, then left, glancing in my direction as he exited. A few minutes later, Dave and I were back on the road. But what felt like an ordinary stop quickly took a turn toward the disturbing. A short time after pulling out of Ely, I spotted headlights in my rearview mirror. It was unusual for a car to be so close behind us on this long stretch of nearly deserted highway. But I chalked it up to coincidence and didn't think much of it. But then... As we sped along unfathomably dark stretches of the highway and hours turned into minutes, it became clear that those headlights weren't going away. And neither was that unsettling feeling in the pit of my stomach. As I altered our speed, pushing past 80 miles per hour or dropping down to 55 miles per hour, our nocturnal passenger kept pace with us, never wavering or overtaking. It was like something out of a psychological thriller or urban legend. Dave, I said through gritted teeth, knowing full well who was tailgating us. That guy from the diner, he's following us. Dave shifted nervously in his seat, trying to make out any details about the car that tailed us with such malicious intent. We couldn't see the make or model due to the darkness that stretched between us. But there was no denying that those headlights were unwavering and impossibly close. The situation soon intensified from eerie to downright terrifying when the driver behind sped up and began ramming into our trailer at high speeds. The impact caused our truck to sway dangerously, and I struggled to maintain control of the massive vehicle as it threatened to topple over with each violent hit. In a blind panic, I picked up the CB radio and frantically called for help, but there was just dead air, a void that echoed our isolation on that desolate stretch of highway. That's when it became clear that this wasn't just some random stalker. This was a calculated assault, likely by someone who had been watching us for quite some time. It felt like an eternity as Dave and I fought desperately to outrun our attacker. We finally managed to lose him after swerving off into an abandoned gas station, using the darkness and the dilapidated buildings as cover. Our hearts raced, and we could hardly catch our breath as we listened intently for any signs of movement outside the truck. Muted whispers filled the otherwise silent night as Dave and I discussed our options. Should we call the police? Confront the driver ourselves? or just frantically drive away from this nightmare? With no cell phone reception in this remote area, we decided our best chance of survival was to wait it out until morning, hoping that our pursuer would give up or move on. As dawn crept across the horizon, we cautiously pulled back onto the highway, eyes peeled for any trace of those menacing headlights. Our hearts hammered in our chests as every passing vehicle became a potential threat, each mile marker a reminder of the unseen danger lurking behind. 
Despite the lingering unease, we eventually made it to Sacramento and completed our delivery without further incident. However, that harrowing journey left an indelible mark on both of our lives. The sleepless nights that followed were filled with nightmarish visions of relentless headlights and a sinister determination to pursue us to the ends of the earth. But even as life carried on and we continued our work as truckers traversing America's highways, that experience taught us some vital lessons about vigilance, trusting one's intuition, and facing adversity with courage. And while some questions still remain unanswered, like who was that man at the Silver Spoon Diner or what were his motives, perhaps some things are better left locked away within the darkest recesses of memory. That unexpected encounter on Highway 50 serves as a stark reminder that danger can find us anywhere, even on a seemingly ordinary night in a quiet roadside diner miles from nowhere. Have you ever had one of those moments when something feels off but you just can't put your finger on it? I was driving my big rig down a quiet two-lane highway somewhere in Oregon on an otherwise ordinary night, trying to wrap my head around that very feeling. My name is Niles Coburn, and I've been a truck driver for almost 15 years now. I was heading toward a small town for a drop-off, nothing out of the ordinary. The highway was unusually quiet that night, with hardly any traffic. My longtime buddy, Val Lachlan, a fellow trucker, we would occasionally banter on the CB radio to keep our spirits up, was nowhere to be found. It was strange not having Val around. He frequented this route as well. As I approached my destination, the small, unremarkable town of Hampton, I noticed that some of the houses along the road seemed abandoned, almost as if people had just packed up and left without warning. At the local diner, all I found were locals who seemed uneasy and tight-lipped when asked about these abandoned homes. It wasn't until Big Tony from the diner finished his cigarette and muttered something about the shadow man that I thought this story might have more to it. Even though he seemed uncomfortable talking about it, Tony shared that there'd been an increase in mysterious disappearances recently. But each time someone vanished, no signs of foul play or struggle were found. The next day began pretty normally, until I realized several crates were missing from my truck. The locks were intact, but it was evident someone had gone through my cargo in a hurry. This couldn't be a random thief, as people warned me against lingering around Hampton due to troubles. But neither could those sudden disappearances be exaggerated rumors now. Still skeptical but increasingly wary, Val and I teamed up to probe deeper into the eerie series of events. During one of our searches, we stumbled upon a series of hidden text messages between some of Hampton's residents revealing a deep-rooted fear of the Shadow Man. Locals claimed they could see him lurking in the darkness, just outside the streetlights. No one had ventured to confront him just yet. When Val and I cautiously decided to pursue this lead, we asked around for more information and discovered that the Shadow Man had started appearing around the same time as the disappearances. We began researching and collecting evidence, trying to find a correlation between the man's movements and the missing people. Days into our investigation, while reviewing security footage from a hardware store near an abandoned house, we saw it. The Shadow Man wasn't just a figment of people's imagination. He must have been Zane Driscoll, a notorious serial killer who'd been on the run for years. We realized that Zane must be skilled at evading capture given his track record and attention to detail when abducting his victims. Terrified but determined to put an end to his reign of terror, Val and I informed local law enforcement about our findings. 
The news about Zane spread among locals like wildfire, with people barricading their homes or leaving town altogether until the killer was apprehended. Miraculously, and aided by our discoveries, authority finally managed to corner Zane Driscoll in an old, dilapidated warehouse on Hampton's outskirts. As he was led away in shackles, I couldn't shake the chilling thought that this monster had been spending weeks within feet of us all, undetected. I only wish we'd decipher these mysteries sooner. That day marked my last visit to the picturesque town of Hampton, with its dark underbelly forever etched into my memory. And that off-kilter feeling I mentioned at the start? Yeah, I trust it now, every last gut-churning ounce of it. After that harrowing experience in Hampton, Val and I swore never to ignore our instincts again. We became more vigilant and cautious while on the road, occasionally lending a hand in solving local mysteries or helping distressed travelers. Our bond grew stronger as we faced challenges together, traveling highways that seemed just a little less lonely now. As for me, the Shadow Man incident taught me important lessons about trust and intuition. I learned to listen to the whispers of my instincts and to pay heed when something felt amiss, even if I couldn't quite pinpoint it at the time. And so, as we continued rolling down those endless roads and witnessing countless sunsets, our CB radios crackling with bated breath, we kept our eyes wide open always hopeful of untangling another web of secrets lurking in the shadows of a small town. Why did I decide to take that shortcut? The small town of Clymer in Pennsylvania seemed like a nice detour off Highway 22. Little did I know back then what kind of hell would unfold during the long Wednesday hours of November 10, 1999. My name is Jackson McAllister, and I'm a truck driver by trade. You meet a lot of colorful people on the road, but that one in particular will forever be etched in my mind. After filling up at a local gas station, I rolled into Rosie's Diner, you know, the small family-owned joint right off Kennedy Street. I didn't think much about it until Jim and Martha came into view. They were having a heated argument when they burst through the door, causing me to choke on my coffee. The whole room went silent. You could have cut the air with a knife. What's wrong with you two? asked Rosie from behind the counter. You wouldn't believe it even if we told you. Martha replied with trembling hands. Jim stormed outside and lit up a cigarette, fuming like an angry bull. It turns out that their teenage daughter had gone missing two nights ago under mysterious and unsettling circumstances. Her bedroom was ransacked, but nothing was stolen. The local police were stumped. There hadn't been anything like this ever before in Clymer. Filled with curiosity, I talked to Jim for more information as he recounted his story. We heard strange noises coming from her room just before we found her gone, like someone was scratching the walls. I couldn't help but feel a cold shiver run down my spine, thinking how terrible it must be to lose your child like that. No one could have guessed something darker awaited us all. That night in my motel room next door to the diner. As wild dreams shook me awake, shattered glass pierced through my ears but silenced me suddenly. I wiped the slumber from my face and peeked through the window, seeing nothing but the murky darkness enveloping climbers' forgotten paths. That's when I noticed a figure running in fear. It was Martha. My gut told me to follow her, even though my mind screamed no. It was below freezing. We were both in our pajamas, feeling exposed and vulnerable. As we approached the parking lot on Creekside Lane, we met a gruesome scene that left me sick to my stomach. A mutilated body lay in a pool of blood. It was Jim. Two of his fingers had been cut off, and he placed them in his mouth. 
It looked like he had tried to crawl away but didn't get far. Martha gasped when she realized one of his shoes had gone missing. That shoe was found by a forester hanging in the woods, where our Rebecca disappeared. The next few weeks were torturous for Clymer, as people lived in constant fear, paranoia consuming them with every breath. It wasn't until the last day of November that an old man named Earl barged into Rosie's diner, frantically asking if anyone had seen his son Joseph. Joseph's gone missing! Last seen near Creekside Lane, Earl shouted while showing people a photograph of his son, who worked for a logging company close by. The news spread like wildfire and formed search parties. The authorities managed to find more mutilated victims, all belonging to an unsanctioned underground fight club known as Red Fist. At last, during the final hours of fear, it all made sense. Joseph Barnett was a victim caught unawares in this oppressive web. The man who built everything on fear and violence had been found hanging from a tree, just like those shoes near Rebecca's final steps. Days later, I visited the local tavern where townspeople were beginning to fill back into their routines, wanting answers too late. Whispers of Joseph Barnett filled the room. The enigmatic Red Fist participant finally met his bitter end. Revenge, it seemed, had been the driving force behind the things that transpired in Clymer. And yet, deep down, I knew someone else was responsible for these heinous crimes and perhaps Joseph Barnett was just another piece in a much larger, twisted game. Whoever pulled the strings remained a mystery, leaving Clymer haunted by the shadows of their true tormentor to this day. I eventually returned to the road, driving for miles and days on end, yet the horrors of Clymer kept me restless during the long, lonely nights. Whenever I passed a small town, I couldn't help but wonder what secrets hid behind the shadows of seemingly innocent places. Weeks turned into months, months into years, but my thoughts remained in Clymer, consumed by unanswered questions and an unsettling feeling that something more sinister had been at work. Trying to put the past behind me, I continued my career as a trucker and attempted to bury the grim memories deep within my subconscious. But in every remote corner of America I roamed, whispered stories emerged of missing people and mutilated bodies found hanging from trees. The pattern seemed hauntingly familiar. It was the same force that had tormented Clymer, now creating a trail of tragedy across all corners of the nation. The eerie thought crossed my mind. What if Clymer was merely a prelude to a larger game for this unseen mastermind? No matter how many miles I covered or what new destination awaited around the bend, the phantom from Clymer would follow me like a dark cloud, forever lurking in my rearview mirror. I still remember that day like it was yesterday. June 19, 2017. I was somewhere in the middle of South Dakota, driving my fully loaded 18-wheeler on Interstate 90. My name is Rexton Gunder's daughter, and I've been a truck driver for over a decade. It's not the most glamorous job, but it pays the bills and lets me see parts of the country that most people never get to experience. It was late in the afternoon when I pulled into a rundown truck stop to refuel and grab a quick bite to eat. I wasn't expecting much from the greasy spoon diner attached to it, but at least it wasn't another prepackaged meal from my cab. Hey Rexton! I heard a familiar voice call out as I entered the diner. It was Murphy Kolodinsky, an old buddy of mine from training back in the day who'd also become a trucker. The years hadn't been kind to him. If anything, they'd only exacerbated his already abrasive personality. What brings you to this godforsaken place? 
he asked after exchanging pleasantries and some admittedly crude jokes. Just passing through on my way to Seattle, I responded as we took our seats at a worn-out booth near the back. How about yourself? Delivering some mysterious cargo to God knows where, he said with a conspiratorial wink. We continued to catch up as we devoured our greasy meals, but there was something off about Murphy, as if every joke he made had an undercurrent of unease flowing through it. After leaving the diner and getting back on the road, I couldn't shake Murphy's unsettling behavior from my mind. Something had clearly happened since we last saw each other. But what? Thumbing through an old road atlas stuffed in my glove compartment, I noticed markings clustered around a specific part of the state. Curious, I decided to take a detour to the area, thinking it might give me some insight into what was going on. I'd barely been driving ten minutes when I heard something in the back of my truck, something that didn't belong. Pulling off to the side of the road, I threw open the rear doors and was immediately slapped with a stench so putrid my eyes watered. Dozens of mutilated animal carcasses were sprawled across the floor, their insides hanging out like grotesque streamers. Shaken to my core, I slammed the doors shut and desperately tried to process what I'd seen. There was absolutely no way those grotesque remains were there when I completed my last delivery inspection mere hours ago. Panicked, I grabbed my CB radio and attempted to contact Murphy, knowing he had driven a nearly identical route as me after we parted ways at the diner. Silence answered me again and again until, finally, his voice cracked through. Rex, you need to get out of here now. Before I could ask questions or even grasp what was happening, I saw a figure emerge from the shadows in my rearview mirror. Grimy and horrifyingly disheveled, they were dragging a knife-like implement that was elongating into a cruel hook. With little time to react, I stepped on the gas and peeled out onto the main road as fast as my rig would go while keeping an eye on that sinister figure in my mirrors. But as quickly as it had appeared behind me, it vanished into the darkness once more. When things finally calmed down enough for me to catch my breath and refuel at another truck stop hours later, Murphy finally had enough composure to tell his story. It turned out that over the past few months, there had been countless reports from truck drivers alluding to this terrifying reality. A mysterious figure known as the Roadside Ripper was hunting us down and leaving a trail of gruesome slaughters in its wake. The last I heard, officials were still unable to apprehend the Shadow Reaper, and no real identity or motive had been offered for these untimely deaths. While I reluctantly continued to drive, my heart pounds in fear any time I stop to rest always wondering if the next truck that approaches is really pulling over just for a quick meal or something far more sinister. The paranoia surrounding the roadside ripper only intensified as time went on. Online forums buzzed with speculation, truckers grew increasingly wary on their routes, and every unexpected sound or movement carried the threat of danger lurking in the shadows. Some nights, I'd find myself gripping the steering wheel so tightly that my knuckles turned white, my eyes darting between the side mirrors and the seemingly endless road ahead. Sleep was elusive. Even when parked safely at crowded truck stops, I'd see the face of that grimy figure with its menacing hook in my mind's eye. One day, during a rest stop, I ran into a fellow trucker named Cassandra, who had also encountered something out of a nightmare. Over cups of black coffee and stale donuts, she told me of her own chilling experience, similar to mine but with one significant difference. She had managed to tail the Ripper back to an abandoned warehouse somewhere off the beaten path. Although we both knew it was dangerous, our shared fear and instilled determination led us to make a pact to find the roadside ripper ourselves and stop these gruesome acts once and for all. 
Armed with nothing more than our survival instincts and sheer willpower, we set off on a mission that would either unveil the truth or lead us down another rabbit hole into terrifying darkness. I was cruising down a lone stretch of I-40 headed towards Albuquerque, just another long haul for the week. My name is Riker Donovan, and driving trucks has been my life for over 20 years now. I've seen some bizarre things in my time on the road, but nothing could prepare me for what happened during this seemingly routine trip. It was getting late. I had pulled over to the side of the road for a quick smoke break before pushing through the last leg of my journey. The moon was nearly full, casting an eerie glow over the desolate landscape. As I was about to get back in the truck, I noticed a man standing near the tree line, just beyond the shoulder. He had his back turned to me, and he looked like he might be hitchhiking or maybe waiting for someone. This wasn't completely out of the ordinary, but something felt off about this guy. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to ask if he needed help. Hey, buddy! I called out as casually as I could muster. You need a lift or something? He turned slowly to face me, revealing a sinister smile that made my skin crawl. No, he replied smoothly. I'm waiting for someone else. The man was wearing a jacket with a patch on it that read Mason Stafford. Unsure what else to say, I got back in my truck and called it in over the CB radio to let others know there was someone strange out here. A few fellow truckers acknowledged my message and advised me to keep moving. Feeling somewhat uneasy but wanting to fulfill my duties, I pressed onward towards Albuquerque. About an hour later, I couldn't shake this sense of growing paranoia that Mason would somehow find his way back into my life. As I pulled into a rest stop outside of town with one final delivery on my schedule, a fellow trucker named Hank approached me. He had heard about the strange encounter from my previous transmission and wanted to share something that he knew about Mason Stafford. The guy's a known criminal. Hank said in a hushed tone, glancing around to make sure no one was listening. Apparently, he's wanted for a series of grisly murders. They call him the Highway Hunter. Just last week, they found one of his victims at a rest stop not far from here. The guy's messed up really bad. Stay away from him if you can. My heart raced as I finished up my last delivery eager to put as much distance between myself and that rest stop as possible. Weeks passed by, and I had nearly forgotten about my brief encounter with the highway hunter. That is, until one evening, when I received a call from an unknown number. To my horror, it was Mason Stafford. Chills ran down my spine as he revealed how he had overheard my warnings on the CB radio. He knew who I was and where I lived. He painstakingly collected information on me all this time. He threatened to visit me at home if I ever dared to share his secrets again. It wasn't until days later that I learned the extent of his crimes and who he really was, a twisted man who preyed on unsuspecting truckers along America's highways. I heard rumors that Mason Stafford finally met his end somewhere in the Midwest killed during an encounter with one of his would-be victims. Even still, those haunting memories will never leave me. I will forever wonder if one day the highway hunter might return for revenge. Moving on from that harrowing experience, I vowed to be more cautious on the road and focus on my job more than ever before. In some way, Mason Stafford taught me a valuable lesson about staying vigilant and trusting my gut instincts. Over the years, I invested in additional security measures like dash cameras and motion detectors around my truck. I leaned on the community of fellow truckers, 
who shared their own stories of close encounters and helped me feel less alone. As time rolled by, the fear gradually subsided, replaced with camaraderie and a sense of belonging among those who had faced similar experiences. Life on the road gave me a new perspective. Every mile I drove strengthened the bond with my peers, who faced the same long hours, vast distances, and unforgiving elements that come with truck driving. The highways that once seemed like haunted hunting grounds for predators like Mason Stafford became a place where we truckers looked out for each other, sharing warnings over CB radios and coming together at rest stops after long days behind the wheel. The highway hunter may have left his mark on me, but it also made me a part of something greater. It's not the life events that define us, it's how we learn from them, adapt, and grow stronger together. And moving forward, I'll always remember that those miles traversed make up more than just one story. They represent an entire community bound together by our collective experiences. You wouldn't believe what happened to me during a trucking run last year. It was the kind of experience that gives you shivers whenever you think about it. On July 13th, I arrived in Amarillo, Texas, with no idea of the chilling events that would unfold. I loaded up my cargo at the warehouse while my boss, Raymond Voigt, checked off items on his clipboard and went over the details of the delivery route a standard cross-country haul. While handling a heavy crate, I accidentally dropped it on my left foot amidst the worker's laughter. The pain was intense, but it didn't compare to what I would encounter later. My name is Donovan McGuire. For almost a decade, I've driven my rig thousands of miles across America. In that time, I've encountered all sorts of locals, some friendly, others less so, but never before had I come across someone like Mason Rivers. Having left the warehouse late due to the injured foot incident earlier that day, I decided to stop at Locke's Diner for dinner before hitting the road again. As I settled into a worn booth, an uneasy feeling came over me, as though something wasn't right. In any case, I brushed it off as being stressed and hungry. I dug into my greasy burger while eavesdropping on two seasoned truckers in the next booth named Pete and Rick. They were exchanging tales of peculiar incidents they'd witnessed on their lengthy careers on the road, both convinced that they had seen stranger things than one another. Although their conversation initially amused me, it gradually stirred up a sense of unease as they started discussing an alarming crime wave in smaller towns throughout Texas. According to them, reports were surfacing about people being stalked and attacked by a mysterious figure who emerged from seemingly nowhere and vanished just as quickly. What unnerved me most was their mention of Mason Rivers, someone known only by that name to the victims and witnesses of these brutal attacks. The circumstances of these crimes were chillingly consistent, with each victim recalling the same tall, dark figure who inflicted both physical and psychological damage before disappearing without a trace. As Pete and Rick delved deeper into the case, they uncovered hidden motives and connections between the victims. Local gossip suggested that Mason might be a scorned individual bent on revenge or a sadistic, bloodthirsty killer with an insatiable hunger for violence. I left the diner feeling thoroughly unnerved but still skeptical. I never believed too much in urban legends. I started my rig and continued my journey on a long, desolate road, although today felt different. Perhaps it was because of those gruesome tales I'd heard earlier. Hours later, after several stops and seemingly endless miles behind me, I witnessed a figure standing beside the road in the middle of nowhere the darkness engulfing every inch of its tall frame. 
instinctively stepping on the brakes and squinting into the darkness. I could make out sharp features and daunting eyes staring directly at me. My heart raced as seconds seemed to be stretched into hours. I realized this couldn't be a person. This had to be Mason Rivers. Adrenaline coursing through my veins, I stepped on the gas pedal and raced down that lonely road, hoping to escape whatever nightmare was standing there. At every turn, I felt its presence following close behind me. I called my boss, Raymond, for help, but in my panic, maintaining focus and navigating became nearly impossible. As if fate took pity on me, another truck appeared in front of me out of nowhere. Pete's rig. Red lights flickered across my face, a signal that prompted me to floor it even more. The suddenness forced me to swerve off route into an abandoned gas station. Only then did reality feel like it was coming back together. A jovial laughter echoed into the air. I recognized it. It was Raymond Voigt. After sighs of relief, he revealed that Mason Rivers was a man from the Texas Hellraiser's Motorcycle Club, a local legend created by him and his fellow truckers, like Rick and Pete, as a darkly humorous attempt to get under the skin of their peers. Days had passed since that bizarre experience, and I laughed it off as just another daredevil prank. But deep down inside, the icy sense of fear lingers, and a part of me will always question, was there something supernatural in the shadows? Since that fateful night, I've continued my trucking career, traversing the vast American landscape with an ever-watchful eye. The camaraderie among truckers is something I've come to cherish more than ever. We share stories and support each other through thick and thin, united by our profession's unique challenges and experiences. The legend of Mason Rivers is now a staple in our storytelling around late-night campfires a tale that sends shivers down the spines of newcomers and seasoned truckers alike. As for me, I've learned to take these encounters in stride, considering them just another piece of the colorful tapestry that makes up our lives on the open road. However, in the darkest corners of my memories, the question remains, was it all just an elaborate prank? Or did fate reveal a glimpse into something far deeper and sinister lurking beyond our comprehension? I was never the superstitious type, but that changed the night I made a pit stop at a seemingly ordinary gas station somewhere between Redding and Sacramento. It was on a lonely stretch of road, far from any town or city lights. I drove an old 18-wheeler for a living back then. I'd been doing it for about 15 years. My life was as rugged as the dusty roads I traveled, with my morning coffee and late-night banter over the CB radio with my fellow truckers serving as the only constants. On this particular night, I was running behind schedule and figured I'd be making up time while everyone else slept. As I pulled into the deserted station to fill up, I noticed a worn-out black sedan parked off to one side. It reminded me of my dad's old car he had when I was a kid, a classic that once looked stunning but had obviously seen better days. I exchanged glances with the only attendant at the just barely open 24-hour gas station booth. His name tag said, Lenny, and he gave me an uneasy smile from his perch behind thick, scratched glass. As I started fueling up, suddenly the air around me felt cold and unnerving. A man who seemed to appear out of thin air approached me from behind. Hey there, he said. His voice was raspy and strained, yet strangely soothing. Oh, hey, I didn't see you there, I replied, quickly masking my initial alarm. My name's Dennis. He introduced himself with a grimy handshake of his nicotine-stained fingers. He stood there for a minute or two 
regaling me with stories about how he used to drive rigs like mine back in his day. These slight pauses in his speech gave me just enough time to visualize those miles-long pages of his life story. We were interrupted by Lenny from inside the booth. Hey Dennis, don't bother the customers, man. Lenny barked, clearly aggravated by this unwelcome intruder. No worries, Lenny. I assured him, figuring this conversation would be just staring into the night until my tank was full. There was something mesmerizing about Dennis' speech, a captivating tone in it that hooked me into his stories of his past misadventures. However, as the tales unfolded, a subtle darkness started to loom over them. Stories of him roughing up rivals for payment, or routine violent brawls quickly escalated to recounting taking gruesome and elaborate revenge on those who betrayed him. Now I'm not one to brag, he said, but there's nothing prettier than watching a man's face contort before his last breath. He continued talking about his life of crime roller coaster ride as if it were all old news. I used to be quite influential around these parts. He explained with an eerie grin plastered against his yellow toothed mouth. But now that chapter is closed. He added with a glint in his eyes that reflected both fire and ice. The fuel nozzle clicked, signaling that my apprehension filled fill up had come to an end. Dennis seemed lost in thought for a moment before snapping out of it and bidding me farewell with another creepy grin. I couldn't help but feel relief as I climbed back into the cab of my truck and hit the road again. I stopped at a truck stop some 40 miles down the road and met up with an old buddy named Walt. Over our conversation, I recounted what had happened at that gas station and asked if he had ever heard anything about that guy Dennis around these parts. Walt wiped his coffee-drenched beard and leaned across the table to exchange a knowing look. You think I won't forget someone like Dennis Halverson? He replied, confirming that all the stories Dennis had shared with me were, in fact, his own. And for anyone who knew about what he did, he was a true ghost of that once infamous past. Walt explained that Dennis was a notorious hitman in the 1970s and 1980s, working for some of the biggest names in organized crime. He had supposedly vanished around 20 years ago, and no one had heard from or seen him since. Many assumed he ended up six feet under himself. When I asked Walt how he knew Dennis' last name without me ever mentioning it, he revealed that the name tag, Lenny, belonged to Dennis himself. Apparently, he had taken on a new identity and chose to stay under the radar by working at that desolate gas station. It seemed that, with his criminal past, he preferred isolation and anonymity over his former notoriety. As Walt and I continued talking, a sense of unease washed over me. I realized how close I had been to a man who once brought terror to his enemies and dominated the criminal underworld. The chilling encounter with Dennis left me reconsidering my previous skepticism towards superstition. Perhaps some people truly carried a dark aura around them. From that day on, my solitary drives along those empty stretches of road started to feel even more lonely, as if that night's haunting brush with danger would forever cast its shadow over my thoughts. Weeks later, in the comfort of my home, I still couldn't shake off the unsettling feeling that lingered from my encounter with Dennis Halverson at that gas station. And yet, somehow, it reminded me of the importance of living in the present and cherishing life for all its simple pleasures, even those rare moments of solace away from the grueling demands of the open road. I still remember that day vividly. It was a Friday, around 6 p.m., and I had just crossed into Nevada on my way to Las Vegas to make a routine delivery. 
My name is Warren Sizemore, by the way, and I've been a truck driver for nearly two decades. Up until that point, the drive had been uneventful, just like any other on that desolate stretch of road. As I continued cruising along the interstate, the only thing keeping me company was the chatter from my CB radio. A gobbled message came through from a fellow trucker who went by the handle rattlesnake Sid. Sid said he'd seen something unusual at the last rest stop. He mentioned a dark SUV with tinted windows parked in an odd spot near the exit of the area. I didn't think much of it at the time. It's not unusual to see weird things every once in a while on these lonely drives. I stopped at the next rest area to take a short break from driving. The sun was slowly disappearing over the horizon as I parked my rig next to an old station wagon packed with camping gear. The driver, a young guy named Mickey Shepard, struck up a conversation as I lit up a cigarette. Say, he said nervously while glancing over his shoulder. Have you seen that black SUV? For the past few stops, I've noticed it, and there's always someone hovering nearby. Suddenly remembering Sid's message from earlier, I looked around cautiously but saw no sign of the SUV. As Mickey and I chatted some more, we learned that we both had similar work schedules that would keep us on this route for several more hours together. We exchanged contact information on our CB radios and returned to our vehicles before they closed for maintenance. As night fell and I continued down the highway, my thoughts were consumed by Mickey's comment about the mysterious SUV. I decided to turn off the interstate and get a bite to eat at a roadside diner named The Silver Moon. Taking a booth by the window, I had a clear view of the usually deserted parking lot. Partway through my meal, I spotted the black SUV from earlier pull-in, and instinctively, I reached for my truck's key fob to make sure it was locked. Suddenly, Mickey's voice came over my CB radio. Hey Warren, you won't believe it, but that black SUV is following me. They're getting closer. They're not sure what to do or what they want. Panicking, I threw some cash down on the counter and ran back to my truck. I floored it out of the diner's parking lot and tried to catch up with Mickey while reaching out on the CB. His voice was barely audible as he frantically whispered that the SUV occupants had started shooting at his vehicle. A pained scream came through just before the line went silent. I continued driving at full speed and soon spotted Mickey's vehicle on its side, with the dark SUV parked nearby. Two figures emerged from within, dragging Mickey's limp body out of his car. As they began striking him with a metal pipe, rage boiled inside me along with overwhelming fear. Making a quick decision, I floored the accelerator again and aimed my truck straight at them with full force. The impact sent them flying off in different directions before they crashed into their vehicle. I knew life would never be the same after that night. Months after these horrifying events unfolded, I found out from another driver, who happened to be a retired cop, that the men in the SUV were part of a notorious gang known for human smuggling and other violent crimes across Nevada. Their names remain unknown but their evil acts ended abruptly that fateful night due to our unexpected encounter. I still shudder as I remember their almost lifeless eyes staring up at my truck just before impact. The ultimate face of pure evil vanquished only by the determination to save a fellow traveler and friend on that dark desert highway. The weeks that followed were filled with sleepless nights and an unshakable paranoia. I couldn't help but wonder if other members of that gang would come after me for their fallen comrades. Mickey, who was lucky to have survived that night, suffered a serious head injury and remained in a coma for several weeks. During that time, I visited him every chance I had, feeling it was my duty to be there for him when he woke up. Finally, one afternoon, 
As I sat by his bedside in the dimly lit hospital room, Mickey opened his eyes. Though it took him a few days to fully regain consciousness and piece together the fragments of what had happened, he was ultimately able to recall enough to piece together a portion of that terrifying night. Words soon spread through the trucking community about our story, and in time, we became known as the Highway Heroes. In spite of our new moniker and the improbability of the events that brought us together that night, Mickey and I formed an unbreakable bond rooted in shared trauma and survival. Over the years, despite our initial hesitance to continue driving long hauls alone, both of us persevered. With each loaded mile, we overcame our fears and eventually regained our love for life on the open road. And though we eventually returned to traversing separate paths and working different routes as truckers often do, whenever one of us found ourselves passing through Nevada on that desolate stretch of highway just outside Las Vegas, we took a moment to pause at the Silver Moon Diner recommitting ourselves to remaining vigilant and ever ready to protect our fellow travelers from all manners of danger they too might face on those lonely desert highways. I ain't the type to just blabber on about the things that happen in my life but I can't shake off this one particular night. It was a Friday, right around dusk, as I pulled my rig into one of those 24-hour truck stops just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. The place wasn't anything special, but the coffee was decent enough. I'd been hauling freight cross-country for years, but rarely had I come across such odd characters as I did that night. The lady behind the counter when I went in for my cup of joe didn't offer much in the way of conversation. She just nodded at me and mentioned something about a local news story that had folks in town all on edge. It wasn't until my second round of gas station sushi that a couple of rough-looking guys settled at the table next to mine. They were speaking low and hushed but they must have forgotten how well a trucker's ears can pick up on whispered gossip over the sound of an idling diesel engine. The two spat out names that didn't have much meaning to me at the start. Saul Crenshaw and Tina Valenza, people they said were responsible for some real gruesome acts in these parts lately. Apparently, bodies had been found with cruel symbols carved into them and word around town was that there might be some cultish nonsense going on. Now, normally i just finish up my lukewarm coffee and be on my merry way without paying any mind to such talk. But something felt off about this whole situation, like there was a bigger picture hidden beneath their words. Fast forward an hour or so, and there I was at a red light when who should appear but Miss Tina Valenza herself? When she saw me staring, she gave me this weird smirk before hopping into the passenger seat of a truck that looked like it hadn't been washed since Reagan was in office. Little did I know, my night was about to get a whole lot worse. Without thinking, I followed them back to this old, desolate warehouse. Not that I was investigating or anything, but I couldn't just shake the feeling that something was about to go down. When they began unloading what looked like covered up bodies from the back of that truck, I knew I'd stumbled onto something way out of my league. My heart raced as I tried to maintain enough distance not to spook them but close enough to maintain my view. Just as they started their sinister ritual, lit only by the flickering flames of their torches and my dashboard lights, I accidentally stumbled upon an old beer can with a clang that echoed throughout the empty warehouse. They turned their gaze toward me. Now, I've never been one for sprinting, but you better believe I hightailed it out of there faster than a jackrabbit on a late night run through Flagstaff's high desert grasslands. What followed was a series of narrow escapes and terrifying chases that tested every ounce of skill I had as a driver, and then some. I made it back to town with those two lunatics hot on my tail. 
Just when I thought things were coming to an end and they'd cornered me in an alleyway, the police arrived in the nick of time. Turns out, someone at the truck stop had found a photo of Saul Crenshaw on their phone after overhearing our conversation and putting in an anonymous tip just minutes before they grabbed hold of me. But how they figured out those names still remains a mystery to me. As Tina and Saul were being hauled off in handcuffs, I sat there, shaken and beaten but alive. I'd faced more danger and fear in that one night than during all of my years combined behind the wheel of an 18-wheeler. It was a downright miracle that I made it through in one piece, and I'd never been so grateful to see those flashing red and blue lights. From that day forward, whenever I'd hear whispers about the crimes committed by Saul Crenshaw and Tina Valenza, I'd shudder at the memory of that eerie night in Flagstaff. The following weeks were a blur as the gruesome details of Saul and Tina's twisted cult came to light. The news was filled with stories of their heinous crimes, speculating on their motivations and the extent of their sinister network. For me, it was impossible to shake off what I'd witnessed on that fateful night. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those horrible images play out in my mind haunting my dreams. But amidst all the darkness, there was a glimmer of hope. The knowledge that my actions had helped bring an end to their reign of terror gave me a new sense of purpose, that maybe there really was a reason why I had crossed paths with those two monsters in Flagstaff. As I continued to drive my rig across the vast expanse of this great country, I found myself more aware than ever of the countless lives and hidden stories cruising along beside me on the open road, each one carrying its own hopes, dreams, and even nightmares. They say that life is a highway, and we all choose our own path down it, but sometimes it's the detours we never expected to take that give us the chance to make a real difference. As for me? Well, I still ain't the type to blabber on about my life's adventures too much. But every now and then, as I pull into some far-off truck stop just as the sun is setting and order another lukewarm cup of joe, I can't help but think about how one night's events can change the course of your life forever. I still remember that fateful night with astonishing clarity. It was December 17th, around 2.13 a.m., when I pulled into a small truck stop on the outskirts of Atlanta, Georgia. The place was struggling to compete with the bigger chains nearby, but it had a homely charm that I couldn't resist. Little did I know that this seemingly innocuous decision would set in motion a chain of events that would change my life forever. I had been driving for years. It was my escape route from the gloomy reality of my mundane life. Charlton Huxley, by the way. I started trucking after my father lost his battle against cancer, leaving me and my mom with a mountain of debt. Anyway, so there I was at this dingy truck stop right out of an old movie when I saw her. Lila Prescott, an acquaintance from high school who now worked as a waitress at the diner. Lila and I exchanged pleasantries and inquired about how things had been since we last saw each other. As we talked, she mentioned hearing about a series of disappearances that had been happening recently in the area. Truckers coming and going from town seemed to be disappearing without a trace. At first, our conversation was all laughter and reminiscing, but as Lila delved deeper into these bizarre stories, an eerie chill seemed to creep into the room. Her eyes widened as she told me about a fellow driver named Drew Garrison who had gone missing just last week after stopping at the very same truck stop. As we parted ways with lingering unease in my gut, Lila warned me to be careful on the road and to watch out for anything suspicious. Later in my cab, I tried to shake off those unsettling details from our conversation and get some sleep. 
Just then, someone knocked on my cab's door. Startled and annoyed by that lone figure obscured in the darkness, I hesitantly rolled down the window. He introduced himself as Trent Lockwood, a fellow trucker asking for help with a busted tire. Something didn't sit right with me, but I wasn't one to leave someone in distress, so I decided to give Trent a hand. In hindsight, I guess it was this decision that doomed some good folks that night. Trent and I walked over to his truck in the dimly lit parking lot, our breaths visible in the freezing cold air. The tire looked like it had been through hell, slashed and punctured all over. But before we could move any further, the stench of decomposition hit us. Horrified, Trent kicked open the side door of his trailer to reveal a scene straight out of your worst nightmares. Corpses piled up one on top of another. We panicked, stumbling back from the gruesome scene, when we heard sirens approaching in the distance. Trent bolted for it, but my legs refused to comply, frozen by a concoction of fear and despair. Hours turned into days and eventually into weeks while the police investigated Drew Garrison's murder spree. It turns out he had been killing and abducting fellow drivers for months undetected and had assumed the name, Trent Lockwood, after his last known victim, stashing them all in his death chamber on wheels. As we tried to move forward following that dreadful night, Lila whispered rumors about other truck stops with similar tales of disappearances around Atlanta. It seems evil never truly dies. In light of everything that happened, driving has never been quite the same for me again. It's hard not to look into my mirrors without remembering that night where Drew, Trent, whichever sick man he was, violently altered lives forever with his twisted mind games and murderous rampage. And so, every time I hit the road, memories of that dark encounter haunt me, and the dread of not knowing when such evils might strike again serves as a reminder to always stay vigilant, and never take anything or anyone at face value. You never know what horror lurks beneath the surface. Despite the tormenting memories of that night, the road continues to beckon me. It's an unforgiving mistress who offers no comfort but demands my servitude as a trucker. And though it's almost a form of unspoken penance for me now, my travels have given me a new purpose. I dedicate myself to finding answers, to peeling back the mystifying layers that shroud these sinister occurrences across different truck stops. Gone are the easy times where I could enjoy my journey, listen to some good old country music, and stop at shady diners with no fear. My life has become one of constant vigilance, eyes peeled for telltale signs that might lead to the unraveling of the next ghastly saga. With each passing week, Lila and I find ourselves drawn closer together bonded by our shared trauma and mission to combat this malevolent force plaguing our community. Through late-night conversations at truck stop diners and endless phone calls as I traverse long stretches of desolate highways, Lila updates me on the latest news and whispers from other drivers who've had close brushes with terror along her network routes. Together, we navigate through a dark underworld hidden beneath ordinary America a world of unfathomable horrors lurking behind every corner. For every predator that disguises itself among us, there are simple folks like us, scarred but stronger than before, who will stand in defiance and wage our countless battles against these shadowy fiends day after day, mile after mile. And while time might not heal all wounds or dispel the ghosts that haunt us in the quiet hours of abandoned truck stops, our journey emboldens a steadfast determination within to keep going and shine a light through this murky darkness in hopes of forging a path less fraught with terror for those who follow in our tire tracks. I was doing my usual run down I-80, 
somewhere between Cheyenne and Laramie. It's not often I get spooked on the road, but that day, something just felt off. The time was late afternoon, and I had been on the road for several hours. My name is Raylan Thompson, but folks call me Ray. My rig, Big Bertha, wasn't exactly brand spankin' new, but she never let me down. Or that's what I thought before that eerie evening. It started when I noticed another truck following too closely behind me, strange for drivers like us who usually respect each other's space. The truck eventually pulled up alongside me, honking its horn repeatedly. Inside was a guy who must have been in his late fifties or so. His name? I didn't know it at the time, but he looked like trouble personified. Why don't you back the hell off? I yelled at him through my open window. He didn't respond to my anger or my frustration, so maybe he hadn't heard me. Or perhaps he didn't care. Either way, he kept honking without relenting. Then he got really reckless. He swerved his truck towards my rig, trying to run me off the road. Call it intuition or just plain experience dealing with aggressive drivers after years as a trucker, I knew that I had to find a way to fight back. So there I was, pedal to the metal, trying to outrace him despite Big Bertha's bulk, that sick bastard on my tail all the while. Luckily, we weren't near any major settlements that caused damage or took innocent lives. Before long, two other truckers joined us in our maddening, high-speed dance of death. Their names were Buck Wilmington and Tyrese Simmons. Later, they'd be counted among the few allies against that maniac. At a lover's bridge, we made a snap decision to stand our ground, facing off against our antagonists who'd shown time and again malicious intent. The standoff ended abruptly. He ran his truck straight into Tyrese's rig with such force that both instantly erupted in a massive explosion, but tried to pull me out of the way as the ball of fire roared nearer. We managed to escape just in time, though now Big Bertha was totaled. Quietly, behind the wreckage, I watched as the man emerged from his truck. Shockingly unscathed, he disappeared into the night. That haunting image of him walking away would be forever seared into my memory. As the days passed, we finally learned who was behind those horrific events. Gordon, Black Jack, Foster is a deranged trucker with a perverse sense of retribution for an imagined slight that happened decades ago. Where is he now? Who can say? The last anyone heard of old Black Jack, he went off the radar. His whereabouts are unknown. But sometimes, late at night, when I'm driving with only Big Bertha's ghost for company, I swear I can see him lurking just beyond my peripherals. A chill runs down my spine. It's as though Black Jack is still out there, and maybe our paths will cross once again. After that harrowing experience, Life on the road was never quite the same for me. The camaraderie I once shared with my fellow truckers was tainted by the sinister memory of Black Jack's wrath. I'd find myself constantly glancing in my rearview mirror, half expecting to see his menacing truck bearing down on me. Buck and I stayed in touch, occasionally grabbing a beer at some roadside dive or lending a hand when one of our rigs needed fixing. But there was always a somber undertone to our gatherings, the shared understanding that we'd barely escaped a brush with death and an unspoken fear that it could happen again. During long nights at truck stops, I'd hear hushed rumors about other drivers who'd encountered Black Jack on the road, tales of shattered windshields, slashed tires, and sadistic games of cat and mouse. The darkness that he brought with him seemed boundless, seeping into every corner of our once tight-knit community. I couldn't help but wonder if there would ever come a day when we'd be free of his chilling presence, or if we were all just waiting for the next time he'd strike with brutal vengeance upon one of our own. Either way, 
Each smile that vanished beneath Big Bertha's ghost brought a mixture of gratitude for escaping his wrath thus far and dread for what would come when Black Jack returned to settle old scores. It all started on a seemingly regular Tuesday. I was driving my truck down a familiar stretch of U.S. Route 395 through Nevada on my way to deliver a shipment to California. The empty roads were nothing new for me, but there was something eerie that night. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I shrugged it off and focused on the job at hand. Usually, one of the perks of being a truck driver is the solitude and freedom. Yet, tonight seemed exceptionally lonely. It was sometime around midnight when I pulled up to Thorn, a small rest stop notorious for truckers taking a break from their long hauls. During these stops, we would typically grab some food and chat with other drivers about the unexpected things we'd come across during our trips. As I rolled up to Thorn, I spotted Chad Brighton, someone I knew from our many encounters on the road sipping coffee outside his rig. I parked beside him, and we exchanged our usual greetings. You won't believe what this priest told me the other day, Chad said between drags from his cigarette. Skeptical of yet another weird story from Chad, I entertained him with interest. He began recounting his conversation with an old priest who had confessed that there was evil lurking in this area. But frankly, his tall tales were nothing new after all those miles shared on the open road. Just as he finished snickering at his own absurd story, we saw the headlights of an old Chevy pickup pull into Thorn. The vehicle looked like it had been in one too many accidents but was still somehow chugging along. We watched as its driver stepped out, a tall guy wearing worn-out clothes and sporting a rugged beard. Approaching us slowly and accompanied by an unsettling vibe, he asked if either of us had jumper cables to help him restart his engine. Lucky for him, Chad had some stashed away in his truck. Before Chad could grab the cables, however, we heard a blood-curdling scream from somewhere in the darkness. Fear flooded our bodies. Struggling to maintain our composure, we exchanged anxious looks before checking out where the scream had come from. We found a beaten up body in the bushes, bloodied and bruised beyond recognition. Suddenly, the rugged guy seized Chad's arm and held a switchblade to his throat. It's too bad you two just had to stick your noses where they don't belong. He snarled. Then everything happened so fast. The realization of imminent danger brought on bursts of adrenaline and instinctive actions for survival. I grabbed my tire iron and struck our attacker with all my strength. He crumpled to the ground, unconscious and injured. Chad was trembling but alive. We sprinted back to his truck, called 911, and reported the incident. After hours of recounting the events to police officers and paramedics, we somehow managed to walk away unharmed but shaken to the core. Days later, when I was recovering from our horrifying encounter, a news report caught my attention. It was about the man we'd fought off, Leonard Crenshaw, a serial killer who had terrorized this very area for years. Our narrow escape had led to his capture ultimately preventing further unspeakable harm. We'd come face to face with pure evil that night along U.S. Route 395 through Nevada. Sometimes I still shudder thinking about how close we came to being just a few more victims in Leonard's horrific killing spree. The incident changed both Chad and me forever, shaking our sense of security and transforming the way we approached our job. We coped in different ways. I turned to therapy, whereas Chad chose to rely on more solitude during his trucking routes. The sheer randomness of our encounter made us hyper-aware of our surroundings, 
and we stopped frequenting the easily missed rest stops we'd once cherished. Word spread among the trucking community about what had happened at Thorn. Its location soon became notorious, and drivers began avoiding it like the plague. Ironically, thanks to our harrowing experience, we began gravitating towards the busier rest stops, where at least we could be in the company of other wary souls who understood the dark side few knew about life on the open road. Our bond only grew stronger knowing that we survived a near-death encounter with a monster together. On late night drives now, when I'm all alone on the open road, my mind still wanders to that fateful Tuesday on US Route 395, sometimes wondering if there may be others like Leonard Crenshaw lurking in places where unsuspecting truck drivers usually stop for some rest and a chat, hidden monsters patiently waiting to strike. Our world had shifted forever, but we carried on vigilantly and prepared for whatever tribulations lay ahead. I still remember that night clearly, as if it happened yesterday. It was September 17th, three years ago when I found myself in an eerie situation that still haunts me to this day. My name's Jackson Kolek, and you won't believe what I'm about to tell you. I'm a truck driver by profession been at it for over a decade now. That fateful night, I was at Darlene's Diner by the side of Route 95 in Nevada. It was past midnight as I took a break from the road, enjoying some lukewarm coffee and a greasy cheeseburger. The place was nearly empty, except for the owner, Darlene, and a handful of other patrons who were eagerly soaking up whatever booze they could before last call. While I sipped my coffee, I noticed the late-night news on the bar TV mentioned there had been several mysterious disappearances near the highway recently travelers suddenly gone without a trace. That information lingered in my mind when I returned to my cab and prepared for another long stretch ahead of me. Back on the road, everything seemed normal. The hum of my truck and the glow of that silver syringe moon were calming. But soon enough, I saw an old pickup truck in the distance with its hazards on. My initial thought was somebody needed help. As I drew closer to lend a hand if needed, Two guys approached me one tall and heavy set, with a tattoo peeking out from under his sleeve, the other one short and wiry haired. Both were sweating profusely despite the chill in the evening air. Their names were Leon Fortner and Ray Giordano. They appeared uneasy yet ready to share their story. Leon quickly muttered something about their car breaking down. And while something indeed seemed off about the truck's front end, their explanation felt rushed unnatural. Emotions seemed too raw for a simple car breakdown. Ray briefly chimed in, saying they got jumped by a couple of meth heads who attempted to steal their belongings but fled the scene when they fought back. This made more sense. I agreed to give them a ride down the highway, where they could find help and call the cops. Inside my truck's cabin, Ray and Leon couldn't stop glancing at each other, as if sharing an unsettling secret. Hours passed, and we shared bits of our lives' typical conversations amongst strangers on the road. Ray mentioned that he once did time for assault, something that didn't bother me much since his days of crime seemed over. Still, I couldn't shake off the feeling that they were hiding something far more unsettling. Then came a rest area up ahead, Silverstone Stop, it read in flickering neon light. They insisted that we take a break here. Leon claimed to know a guy who could fix their car right away. The place was isolated and quiet, darkness swirled around the few dim lights dotting the space. That's when all hell broke loose abductions, screams, gunshots ripping through the air. Turned out Ray had been running with a sadistic crew known for luring truckers, robbing them or worse, 
violent organ trafficking in exchange for methamphetamine. The diner owner, Darlene, was part of this gruesome operation too. In the darkness of that rest area, where death and violence unraveled like sinew from bones, I somehow managed to survive and escape as chaos between members engulfed them all in murderous flames. Through blood-stained windshields and roads muddied with dread, I drove away alive but forever haunted by what I witnessed. No one ever found out who orchestrated these horrendous crimes. Whether it was Ray or someone else remains a dark mystery to this day. And as I recount this harrowing experience, the shadows of that blood-soaked night still linger in my mind like an uninvited specter, reminding me to be ever vigilant for the monsters lurking just beneath the surface of our seemingly ordinary lives. Since that night, I've become a different man. The horrifying ordeal I went through has left its mark on me, and it has made me question the intentions of strangers I come across along the road. Trust doesn't come easily anymore, and every seemingly innocent encounter stirs up memories of Leon, Ray, and that fateful night at Silverstone Stop. I've made changes in my life to ensure my safety and to avoid getting into similar situations. Now I always keep a low-profile weapon like pepper spray within reach whenever I'm on long drives. I've memorized the locations of well-patronized rest areas and avoid taking breaks in isolated spots no matter how tired I may be. The sound of laughter in roadside diners now does little to squash the lingering unease inside me. But despite the paranoia and fear that sometimes creeps over me like a dense fog, there is one thing that has remained constant. My love for driving along open American roads. The adrenaline rush keeps me alive, invigorating my spirit mile after mile. When the sun dips below the horizon like an unending final bow, I find solace in remembering that there are still good people out there individuals who would lend a hand without hesitation or ulterior motives. In sharing my story with others at truck stops, bars, or even just among my friends, Perhaps I can remind fellow truckers or travelers alike to stay cautious and aware of their surroundings. For it's only by shining a light on these dark corners of our world that we can uncover the truth about who might be pulling strings behind those seemingly innocent faces hidden beneath eerie shadows. I still remember that eerie night like it was yesterday. It's etched in my mind, every detail as vivid as when it happened. My name is Dexter McAllister, and I'm a truck driver by profession. Driving the lonely highways has its perks and a fair share of creepy moments, but nothing had prepared me for what I was about to face that night. The incident occurred about two years ago on the outskirts of Big Timber, Montana. I was hauling a full load of electronics destined for Boise, Idaho. The highway stretched for miles in a straight line between dense forests on both sides, but I never paid much heed to superstitions or urban legends about desolate places like these. As I continued driving through the darkness, everything seemed just like any other night. Trucks occasionally passed by and there were the familiar sights of gas stations and motels along the way. I was having a great time when my trip took an unexpected turn. At around 3 a.m., the traffic started thinning out until I realized there was no one else on the road with me, not even a single pair of headlights in either direction. After about 20 minutes of driving solo, something caught my eye on the side of the road a beat-up sedan with its hood open and hazard lights blinking. I figured someone could use some help, so I pulled over to the shoulder and braked gently. As I got out of my rig's cab, I looked around. There was still no one else around except for that car's occupants. Walking closer to the stalled vehicle, 
I spotted an older man with an unkempt beard and tattered clothes outside his car, leaning into his open hood. He turned around upon hearing my approach and greeted me stiffly, introducing himself as Lester Blackwood. Beside him stood his companion, a younger woman named Aria, who wore sunglasses despite the darkness surrounding us. Lester explained that their car had overheated and I mentioned I had some extra coolant in my truck. We struck up a conversation while we tended to their broken-down sedan. It was then that Aria began to speak about her and Lester's long, unfortunate journey. The odd couple revealed how they'd been on the run from a vicious psychopath named Johnny Voss, a man with a lengthy history of sadistic crimes, including torture, maiming, and multiple murders. He had made them his next targets after they'd unintentionally seen him at work. My skepticism waned as Aria's story grew more gory by the minute. Her vivid recount of Johnny's acts sent shivers down my spine, eventually leaving me feeling genuinely fearful for their lives. I figured it was best for them to hop into my truck so we could get them to safety faster. As the night wore on and our adrenaline surged, we stumbled upon evidence pointing towards Johnny's sinister presence. Frayed ropes, blood-stained gloves, and scribblings detailing his twisted plans suggested he mapped out their locations meticulously before striking. Cold sweat trickled down my neck as I realized the monster was closing in on us. Our chances of survival grew slimmer with each passing minute. Encountering Johnny would mean almost certain death for any one of us. I tried reaching out to dispatch about our predicament but barely mustered a chuckle when I heard eerie static fill the airwaves instead of human voices. The final confirmation that we were completely alone. Finally arriving in Big Timber just as dawn began creeping up behind us, we found refuge in a roadside inn. Lester and Aria thanked me profusely for saving their lives before slipping off into hiding. It wasn't until later that week that I learned from one of Aria's relatives how deep Johnny Voss' history went when he called me to update me on their situation. The horrors I had heard on that fateful night had barely scratched the murderous surface. I resumed my duties as a truck driver never failing to keep an eye out for Johnny as I crossed paths with unknown vehicles on dark highways. I never found out what happened to Johnny Voss, but Lester and Aria's terrifying tales continued to haunt me, a jarring reminder of the dormant evil lurking in the shadows, lying in wait along isolated roads. Even now, years later, I find myself glancing into the rearview mirror more frequently than I used to and staying extra vigilant while driving through remote areas. In the following months, I contacted the authorities about what had transpired that ominous night. However, they seemed baffled by my report, as if Johnny Voss were a mere myth. Nonetheless, Lester and Aria occasionally sent me reassuring messages from undisclosed locations grateful for saving their lives from impending doom. Though my life returned to relative normalcy, every now and then, when headlights momentarily reflected off something on desolate roads or a coyote's howl pierced the night air, those shivers instinctively returned. As I turn into truck stops and past temporarily deserted areas, a lingering uneasiness never fails to grip me. A subtle acknowledgement of the boundless terror Johnny Voss brought upon his victims in the darkest corners of our vast country. I never thought driving trucks for a living could lead to such a harrowing experience. It was June 7th. Around 3 a.m., and I was on a long stretch of a winding road in a secluded part of New Mexico, on my way to Albuquerque with a hefty load of construction materials. My name is Monty Kensington, a 36-year-old truck driver from Denver, Colorado, 
and I thought I'd seen it all during my 15 years on the road. I was wrong. All this time, darkness had enveloped the night sky. The moon shone brightly, casting an eerie glow along the deserted road as I downed yet another cup of cold gas station coffee, which probably started tasting like stale cigarettes at this point. Suddenly I noticed a figure in the distance. Something felt off about it even before my brain could comprehend what I saw. There it was, an old man in tattered clothing holding an axe. I glanced at the rusty hatchet perched on his shoulder, its wicked gleam glimmering beneath the moonlight. It caught my attention because it wasn't your typical hardware store model. This looked homemade, with unnerving embellishments etched along the handle. He didn't budge when my truck's headlights cut through the darkness, and he just stood there like a twisted statue in the middle of nowhere. After analyzing the situation, my instincts told me not to stop, so I slammed my foot on the gas pedal and sped past him. As time seemed to slow down while my heart pounded rapidly against my chest, I glanced into my side mirror and saw him disappear into the darkness, just as effortlessly as he appeared. For minutes that felt like hours, I drove faster than legally allowed because something within me couldn't shake that sinister feeling creeping through my spine. My decision to get help became much more urgent when red digital numbers at 10.07 p.m. flashed on the dashboard, suddenly changing to an emergency broadcast on my radio that said, Attention! There have been reports of a dangerous individual named Travis Banks. Wanted by local law enforcement for multiple homicides in the area. Do not approach this man. He is believed to be armed and highly dangerous. The description matched the man I had just encountered. Later, when I reached Albuquerque and took a break in an old diner, I could feel the atmosphere among the locals, who were nervously whispering about Travis Banks. Maneuvering through different conversations and trying not to draw suspicion, I struggled to connect the dots and understand his motives. It was mentioned that these killings started a year ago, and all bodies were found near rotting makeshift shrines eerily similar to the wicked motif on Travis's axe. Days after my delivery, I tracked down a reputable crime journalist, a 43-year-old man named Dane Barron who had been closely following the Axman case in his popular online blog. He told me that Travis used to work for a nefarious pharmaceutical company until he got fired under mysterious circumstances. After surviving a bad car accident that left him with severe psychological damage, he inherited his aunt's abandoned rural house, where rumors suggest his twisted journey as the Axman began. Now I am back home in Denver, still pondering over that night, how close I came to certain death at the hands of a sadistic man-man who remains at large. For me, the memory of Monty Kensington vs. Travis Banks stains my dreams like red ink on white canvas, an abyss of darkness invaded by unnerving visions laced with terror. No closure nor solace reached my doorstep just an everlasting reminder of what happened on that seemingly innocuous night somewhere in this vast country. Months have passed since that fateful night, and I now find myself on the road again, handling another long-haul run. The thought of Travis Banks still lingers in the back of my mind, a constant reminder to never let my guard down. My driving habits have significantly changed. No longer do I work nights or stop at isolated rest areas. Instead, I opt for well-lit truck stops where there are always others around to deter any unwanted encounters. My cab has become my sanctuary, stocked with various self-defense items within arm's reach should the unthinkable occur. I've also connected with other truckers who've had similar experiences forming a network of individuals with shared stories and a determination to ensure each other's safety on the open road. As we communicate through our CB radios, 
We keep each other updated about suspicious activities that we hear or encounter ourselves. My story has not only drawn attention from fellow truckers but also from law enforcement agents, who are now coordinating efforts to track down Travis Banks. Although they've made progress in piecing together his past and uncovering his twisted motives, Travis remains elusive, a specter of death that still haunts those he manages to cross paths with. Every now and then, another victim is discovered among those desolate roads, their bodies found near those sinister makeshift shrines, echoing Travis Banks' sickening signature. Despite the never-ending horror that looms over each mile I drive, there's a silver lining. I've used my platform as both Monty Kensington, the trucker, and survivor to bring awareness of these dangers to fellow drivers and communities across America. My experience taught me that life on the road is unpredictable, and every day we must face our fears head-on. Now, as I continue to navigate this vast country, I hope that sharing my story will not only prevent others from falling victim to the axeman but also put an end to Travis Banks' reign of terror, both for my own sake and for the sake of countless others whose lives are dictated by the long, lonely highways that stretch on into the unknown. I never thought my most memorable job as a truck driver would lead to this. It all began at 3.30 a.m. on April 23rd, a few years ago. I found myself parked at a deserted truck stop on the outskirts of a small town in Texas called Pinehurst. The neon sign sputtered on the empty lot, barely illuminating the surroundings. I took another drag from my cigarette and glanced over at the worn-out keys of my 18-wheeler. I had just finished a double shift and planned to head home after catching some sleep. Frank Radcliffe, an old buddy of mine, left his business card on my windshield months ago, advertising his new bar somewhere in this godforsaken town. At that moment, everything was quiet, too quiet, not even the buzz of insects in the background. As I reclined my seat and started dozing off, I saw him for the first time. A haggard man scurrying past my cab with something concealed under his jacket. He had greasy, thinning hair and nervously scanned his surroundings, occasionally glancing back at me with worry in his eyes. A pang of unease settled in the pit of my stomach. My curiosity was piqued as I watched him enter a decrepit building nearby. Whatever he was up to didn't seem right on some level, though I couldn't put my finger on what was off about him. Figuring I wasn't going to sleep anyway, I decided to check it out. As I approached the building, accompanied by long shadows cast by the flickering neon sign behind me, I noticed muffled voices from inside. The voices grew louder as I crept nearer. It sounded like an argument with some panic mixed in. There wasn't supposed to be anyone here, one voice said, trembling. Relax, replied another voice with more authority. They're probably asleep. Gwyn gave us the go-ahead. Gwyn? That name rang a bell, but I couldn't place it in this context. The door that the man had rushed through minutes ago was cracked open, forcing me to decide between barging in or remaining a silent observer. I took out my pocket knife and decided on the latter. I peeked through the slightly open door, sweat trickling down my forehead. Inside, three individuals stood beside a table adorned with knives, saws, and God knows what else, all covered in blood. I covered my mouth in horror as they started dragging a lifeless body onto the table. The one with the greasy hair pulled out what looked like a revolver from under his jacket. A pale-faced woman nervously chewed her lip while another man taped over the windows. Right then, I heard my name called out in the hushed hour. Tom! Tom Harvey! How are you, buddy? 
Long time no see. Frank Radcliffe burst out of nowhere and began blurting out nostalgic stories from our school days. My heart raced. What if they heard us? At a loss for words, I pulled Frank aside and whispered hurriedly about what I had just witnessed. He fought back his initial disbelief as he took a peek through the door himself. That's when Frank made the connection and told me about Gwen Adams, a local mob boss who got his kicks from torturing and killing people who crossed him. We knew we couldn't just turn away from whatever sick scheme they were wrapped up in. But confronting them head-on wasn't an option either, with their confidence bolstered by Gwyn's authority on their side. Using Frank's connections around town, we managed to collect evidence against Gwyn Adams and hand it over to investigators without leaving any trace of our involvement. It felt surreal watching them cart those twisted psychopaths out in handcuffs, knowing I'd only stopped at that truck stop by sheer coincidence. It's been years since that night, but sometimes it still keeps me up. To this day, I can't shake the image of that blood-soaked table and all the horrors it had likely seen before I pulled into that lonely lot in Pinehurst. After the incident in Pinehurst, life on the road held an eerie sense of unease that hadn't been there before. Every truck stop I pulled into bore an invisible weight a morbid curiosity about what might be lurking just out of sight. It wasn't until I got a call from Frank a year later that I found myself unexpectedly pulled back into the world we thought we'd left behind. He said he had news. Gwen Adams' criminal empire had been rapidly dismantling ever since our fateful intervention, and apparently, it had unleashed a power struggle among his former lieutenants seeking to carve out their piece of the pie. Frank got wind of rumors that they'd been making inquiries about the anonymous source of evidence that took down their boss, trying to track us down as if we were the loose ends they needed to tie up. I didn't want any part of it. This was so far beyond our pay grade. But Frank insisted that we couldn't simply turn our backs now and leave more lives at risk. So once again, we became caught up in a desperate spider's web of deceit and danger. But this time, it felt different. Instead of just stumbling upon something hidden away in an unexpected corner, we were stepping directly into the lion's den with a target on our backs. Each dark alley and unfamiliar face carried a sinister tenor as we navigated through the underworld connected to Adam's shattered criminal enterprise. Our reluctant crusade against them would bring us face to face with cold-blooded killers and unfathomable malevolence, and test the limits of our own morals in ways we never could have imagined when all this began at that desolate truck stop in Pinehurst. I was driving my rig late one evening through the winding back roads of rural Kentucky. It was just another ordinary night on the job, at least, that's what I thought at first. The darkness was all-consuming, barely pierced by my semi's headlights. I had been a truck driver for six years, and in that time, I'd met my fair share of strange characters and had some bizarre encounters but nothing could have prepared me for the events that were about to happen. While my name is Marlo Richardson and my trucking job has enabled me to explore most parts of the country, it also means spending long stretches of time alone. That particular night, I pulled over at a rest stop with nothing more than a dilapidated restroom building and a few rusty picnic tables. As I took a swig from my coffee flask to stay awake, I noticed an old gas station across the road, seemingly deserted. Hunger gnawed at my insides, so I decided to check if they had any snacks or better coffee to keep me going. This wasn't unusual. Every once in a while, you'd find these gems of gas stations hidden away in the middle of nowhere. Little did I know that this gas station would change everything. It felt like something out of a movie as I stepped in 
the dim lighting casting eerie shadows across shelves stocked with dusty candy bars and expired canned goods. A woman behind the counter gave me a half-smile as she flipped through an old magazine with yellowing pages. I picked up some food before hesitatingly asking about any local stories or even rumors about the area. She shared how people had been disappearing without leaving any trace. Locals tried to brush it off as bad luck or dangerous wildlife like cougars and bears roaming around. As unsettling as these details were, skepticism crept into my mind as she shared her tale. I dismissed them as fearmongering rumors born from the isolation. I paid for my food and thanked her, then headed back to my truck. The sun was making its sleepy descent when I pulled away from the gas station. As I drove ahead, the darkness engulfed me. It was as if Mother Nature herself was sealing my fate. I continued down those twisting paths, each bend feeling more sinister than the last. A blood-curdling scream rang out in the distance. If I hadn't been a seasoned driver, high on caffeine and adrenaline, my truck would have veered right off the road. But I knew I couldn't ignore what I just heard, even if it was against my self-preservation instincts. Further down the road, a muddy pickup truck sat abandoned with its doors flung wide open. A light drizzle was starting to fall as I hesitantly approached, feeling the rain soak through my jacket. There were signs of a struggle. Possessions were scattered across the pavement, and deep gashes adorned the side of the truck as though clawed by a wild animal. My stomach dropped at every piece of evidence that further corroborated the stories from earlier. Regardless of my fear and uncertainty, there was no walking away from this situation, not ever since what happened to my brother two years ago. He met a tragic end in a similar incident without any witnesses or assistance. Every day since then, guilt has eaten away at me for not being there. This incident presented an opportunity to make amends and save someone from another gruesome outcome. I quickly used my truck's CB radio to contact the local police. After relaying what information I had and giving directions to my location, they informed me that they would arrive in half an hour or so. That unbearable wait began as minutes ticked by like hours, with just silence and dread for company. Over time, I experienced heightened senses even at small movements within my peripheral vision, expecting an ambush. Sirens finally tore through the silence as police cars arrived at the scene. I relayed my account of events to the investigators, each detail etched into my memory as if scorched with a branding iron. The local officers had been hunting for the person they believed was responsible for many of these cases. His name was Forrest Nightingale, a man with a chilling reputation and an insatiable appetite for cruelty. With each discovery and each body, he remained elusive, like a specter in the night. Days after our confrontation, they finally arrested Forrest Nightingale, caught not too far from where we crossed paths, caught in the process of burying one of his unfortunate victims. The evidence in his lair painted a gruesome picture of the horrors he had inflicted on others over the years. It seemed I wasn't just battling my inner demons. I was up against a real-life monster who haunted those remote Kentucky roads. While my mind replayed the events, trying to discern what might have happened if I hadn't stopped that night, I knew one thing was certain. By facing my fears and confronting those eerie tales from the gas station, I had saved at least one person from sharing my brother's fate. It was a small but significant victory against those haunting shadows, proving that no matter how dark the world may seem, there is still hope and strength within us all. In the years since that fateful night, I continued driving long-haul routes throughout this wild and unpredictable country that I called home. Despite the dangerous encounters and unusual situations that come with this line of work, I've learned with certainty that every chance taken has led me to a life-changing experience.
reminding us that we are never truly alone in our quest for redemption. I still remember that night like it was yesterday. August 17, 2013, somewhere in the rural outskirts of Oklahoma the atmosphere was eerie from the get-go, but I couldn't pinpoint why. Maybe it was the almost palpable sense of isolation that enveloped those desolate roads. My name is Danny McKnight, by the way, and I'm a truck driver. I've been hauling goods across this great country for nearly 20 years now. I never thought I'd have such a story to share. It was another long haul for me, transporting industrial equipment from Wichita to Amarillo. My truck idled at the side of the road while I enjoyed my usual black coffee and cheap gas station sandwich before I hit the road again. That's when a beat-up Ford pickup pulled off a side road and parked in front of me. Its only occupant, an ever-so-average-looking man in his mid-forties, got out to stretch his legs. His name was Cal Thornton, as I later found out. We exchanged brief nods before he struck up a conversation about the mundane aspects of life on the road, cracking jokes and reminiscing about our experiences as truckers. He even offered me one of his cigarettes as we continued to discuss our lives and hardships. After some hours on the road together, we decided to make camp at a nearby parking area. We figured it wouldn't hurt to have someone nearby in case either one of us ran into any trouble during the night. As darkness set in and we settled down for the evening, we continued talking by the light of a lantern. Our conversation soon ventured into deeper territory. Cal mentioned feeling disconnected from people after so many years behind the wheel and his struggle with substance abuse. It wasn't surprising, as many drivers shared similar experiences. That's when things took a turn for the worse. In the distance, we noticed headlights approaching slowly and deliberately. The vehicle seemed to linger on the perimeter of the parking area, catching both our attention and making our previous conversation seem distant. We whispered questions to each other about its intentions but tried not to worry too much at first. We'd seen odd behavior in our time, after all. But then the car suddenly accelerated towards us, its engine roaring as it sped into our little campsite. Its lights blinded us. And as the vehicle came to a screeching halt just in front of my truck, I saw a figure clad in dark clothes and a balaclava exit the car. The masked figure yelled something unintelligible before firing a bullet into the night sky above us. We instinctively ducked for cover behind my truck's bulkhead while adrenaline surged through my veins. Cal and I looked at each other in sheer terror as the gun-toting figure yelled for both of us to hand over our wallets and any other valuables. Without hesitation, we complied and threw them out onto the ground. But it wasn't enough for this madman. He dragged Cal from behind the truck by his collar, forcing him to his knees in front of me, still covered by his weapon. I watched helplessly as he racked another round into his pistol's chamber and pressed it against my new friend's temple. In a split-second decision that I can barely fathom even now, I flung my coffee mug at him with all my might. It smacked him across the face hard enough that he stumbled back and lost control of his weapon momentarily, enough time for us to make a break for it. Cal and I sprinted off into the darkness together, zigzagging between trees as we heard gunshots crackling through the air behind us. He fired relentlessly, screaming profanities as we dashed further away from him. We managed to take cover behind some large rocks until he eventually gave up on his pursuit, but not without the terrifying realization that Cal was bleeding from a gunshot wound to his arm. Weeks after the event, Cal told me that he'd contacted one of his old trucker friends who still had connections in law enforcement. Apparently, 
A man named Derek Webb had been terrorizing truckers along that same route for months and was suspected of at least two gruesome murders. Derek was finally caught when he tried to rob a trucker who turned out to be an off-duty cop. Despite the nightmarish situation, Cal and I survived, only knowing our assailant's identity through sheer luck and the help of an old friend. Looking back, that dreadful night changed us both in ways we never expected. It shook us to our core, revealing the fragility of life. Cal and I forged a bond rooted in that harrowing experience, one that would remain unbreakable for years to come. We grew much more cautious on the road, always keeping an eye out for anything out of the ordinary and encouraging other truckers we met along the way to do the same. As for Derek Webb, he was eventually convicted and sentenced to life in prison for his crimes. Life on the road continued for both Cal and me, albeit with a newfound perspective. The isolation and struggles we once faced continued to challenge us daily, but they no longer controlled us entirely. With each sunrise and sunset we witnessed from our truck's windows, we were reminded of the resilience embedded in our spirits and just how precious life is for those who choose to embrace it, even when it unveils itself through terrifying moments of vulnerability and uncertainty. I couldn't shake this odd feeling as I pulled into the seemingly innocuous rest stop outside of Odessa, Texas. It was like a shaky, feverish adrenaline that hung at the back of my neck. My name is Radley Brinkerman, by the way. I've been driving trucks for the better part of 15 years now. I'd seen some strange stuff on these desolate roads, but nothing too serious until that night. I parked my rig desperate to stretch my legs after hours on the road, and began pacing around the quiet lot. At first glance, everything seemed normal. A couple of other trucks parked with their drivers taking a break from their never-ending hauls and the muffled laughter from a family having dinner in their RV. While I lit up a cigarette, I noticed a man sitting at one of the weathered picnic tables off in the distance. I wouldn't have thought much about him if it weren't for a peculiar sense that he was watching me. He just sat there, not smoking or eating, simply observing. Something didn't feel right. I flicked my cigarette away and walked towards the restrooms, passing by Lucy Ramirez, a fellow trucker I often ran into on these routes. We exchanged pleasantries and idle chit-chat about recent annoying customers when she stopped mid-conversation, glanced over my shoulder, and said, That guy has been staring at you since you got here. Turning to follow her gaze, I spotted that same man from before at another picnic table, this time glaring at me with intent. My heart raced as an uneasy wave washed over me. I tried to play it cool and continued conversing with Lucy while keeping an eye on him from the corner of my eye. He didn't make any sudden moves but continued his cold stare. The eeriness of the situation intensified when we found out that other drivers had noticed his unsettling presence too. Gary Johansson, a seasoned driver of 30 years, gruffly commented that he'd never seen anything like this before. Suddenly and without warning, the man was gone, vanished from his table like a phantom. Everyone exchanged nervous glances as if anticipating something terrible to unfold. We knew little of the menace waiting for us in the darkness. And then it happened, piercing screams erupted from a nearby truck. We rushed over to find their tires slashed to ribbons. The trucker babbled through hysterics recounting an image of the lurking man slinking away just moments prior. A torrent of panic spread in our chests as we realized we were trapped with an enigmatic predator lurking in the shadows. And he wasn't finished yet. Over the next hour, K 
Chaos reigned as drivers checked on each other and their vehicles, struggling to keep tabs on the elusive antagonist. I saw him many times amongst trucks and trailers, but each time he managed to melt away into the darkness. He somehow knew our names without us ever saying them out loud, whispering them ominously into the gusts of wind that stirred up dirt and debris around us. It felt personal like he had a vendetta against each one of us out there that night. We were hostages trapped in a twisted game where this faceless man held control, cutting brake lines, vandalizing engines, and haunting our peripheries with his sinister tactics. Though many tried, nobody could catch him or even get close enough to make out any distinguishable features. It seemed impossible as if he wielded some supernatural power over us. The dreadful ordeal continued throughout the night and into the early hours of the morning until, finally, it ceased as unpredictably as it began, leaving us battered and terrified in its wake. In the aftermath, someone managed to track down a contact from law enforcement days after the events unfolded who knew about strange occurrences in the area and missing truckers from recent months. As it turned out, our silent tormentor was a man named Terence Malvano, a reclusive figure living off the grid in these desolate parts, harboring a deep hatred for the people and machines that invaded his territory. He stalked his prey in the shadows and committed violent acts to assert his control over his domain, almost as if we'd entered his world like trespassers and he was merely defending it. No one understood his motives, and perhaps no one ever truly will. What we all knew for certain, though, was that we had survived a night unlike any other. Months after that harrowing experience, the rest stop incident had mostly faded from our minds. Amidst the countless miles we travel and the ever-changing landscapes, it's easy to forget the past. But for those of us who survived that night, the shadows still held a certain terror. We became more vigilant on our journeys, looking out for one another as we traversed the lonely highways. Small communities of truckers formed, built on shared suffering and camaraderie, an unspoken agreement that we are never truly alone out here. Occasionally, whispers of similar encounters would reach our ears, fueling a rising anxiety within us that Terence Malvano or someone like him might still be lurking out there. Law enforcement eventually deemed the area safe once again, but those of us who bore witness knew better. We knew that something dangerous lingered on the desolate stretches of road, waiting for its chance to strike again. I used to be just like everyone else, going about my day without giving a thought to what could be lurking in the shadows. But all that changed in November of 2007, and I will never be the same again. I'm Dale McKinney, a truck driver from Mobile, Alabama. Born and raised in the Deep South, I've been hauling freight across the country for more than 20 years. I'd seen it all, or so I thought. Little did I know that one night would shake me to my very core. It was your typical Tuesday evening when it happened. I just picked up a load in Podunk, Texas, headed for Reno. The drive was long and dull, as most drives are, just me, the open road, and an endless supply of coffee and cigarettes to get me through the night. That's when it started. I heard an unsettling noise coming from my CB radio. H. Hey there, T. Trucker, crackled a shaky voice I didn't recognize. And then need help, mile marker 116. It must have been a fellow trucker in trouble. As a rule, we look out for each other on these desolate highways. But something about that voice seemed off. Skeptically, following protocol, I asked their name and company. 
They only laughed nervously and repeated mile marker 116 before going silent again. Against my better judgment, I switched to an emergency frequency to report the incident. Frustratingly little help came in reply. They hadn't heard from any truckers in distress tonight at all. They wrote it off as someone playing pranks secretly over miles of dark roadways. But deep down, despite operating with denial etched on my face, something continued eating away at me as truly wrong. At mile marker 116, there was no sign of a stranded trucker. But my gut feeling still urged me to pull over and send out another call for assistance. This time, there was no response. I stepped out, the cool night air seeping into my bones as I scanned the darkness. The shrill blow of a semi-horn caught my attention up ahead. And that's where I saw him, a lone figure on the side of the road, no sign of a vehicle. As my eyes adjusted to the moonlit darkness, I could see his face more clearly, pale and gaunt, but familiar in some way. I couldn't pinpoint it or recognize why, but it was like my memory had served him before. Unable to ignore my instincts any longer, I cautiously approached and asked about his situation or what he needed. From the moment he spoke back, I instantly regretted it all, recognizing that unnervingly shaky voice from earlier. He stumbled forward and began mumbling frantically about a lost shipment and another truck driver who had wronged him. Pieces of the puzzle slowly fell into place as this frantic man named Brad became clearer, rumored in trucking circles for his violent retribution towards those who crossed him. But back then, none of us ever thought such horror tales genuinely held any validity in this community. Rumors were nothing more than childish gossip sometimes passed around campfires or dive bars by our kind. Now facing morbid reality firsthand from this mysterious antagonist I'd only been acquainted with through hearsay. I couldn't suppress genuine terror anymore beneath casual facades usually donned unknowingly around workmates and strangers alike. Panicking internally but attempting civility with each deep breath taken amid unbearably tense words shared hazardously between us two strangers regarding various injustices which befall us all sometimes on roads we roam solo. I attempted making excuses then finally took initiative. Twisting heels into soiled asphalt beneath me before sprinting back across an empty interstate footpath adjoining truck doors swinging open wildly before me once more. Wasting no time to escape, I hit the road, choking on fear as my heart pounded hard against its own chest cavity within me. A casual drive across barren roads would never hold innocence again now tainted by sinister knowledge instead belonging only to heinous crimes committed secretly on shadow-covered paths traversed by a dwindling few free-spirited roamers such as myself. For weeks after that encounter, I was restless and paranoid, always looking back at the endless expanse behind me. Nothing followed, but the weight of the cruel yet timely dangers faced here in this life grew increasingly heavy each day. I tried to forget that night, and hoped it would fade into a distant memory like so many other unremarkable moments of my long-haul career. But the fear that Brad had instilled in me lingered, tainting every stretch of dark, desolate highway I traveled. Every unknown face became a possible threat, and every stopover filled me with anxious dread. I started reaching out to old friends in the trucking community those who had heard the whispers of Brad's grim legend, hoping for some reassurance or advice. Most dismissed my concerns as paranoia brought on by isolation and fatigue, but a few shared similar stories that only fueled my fear further. I realized then that my days as a truck driver had become more than just long hours and endless miles between point A and point B. It was now about surviving the shadowy corners of this world that barely anyone knew existed, where danger could be lurking just around the next bend. 
It was about a brotherhood of drivers who stood vigilant against threats both seen and unseen, ready to lend a hand when needed. So, I kept on trucking, finding solace and forming new bonds with fellow drivers on those lonely roads. We shared tales, traded advice, and stood together against the darkness that haunted our profession. We honored an unspoken code, to see each other through whatever trials or tribulations may come our way. As the years went by and I racked up countless miles behind the wheel, the nightmare that began at mile marker 116 eventually receded into the depths of my mind. But every so often, those long nights spent racing across open highways with naught but my thoughts for company whispered chilling reminders of what once transpired there. And though I eventually made peace with the lingering unease from my encounter with Brad, knowing there were others out there walking similar paths helped me stay strong. Nowadays, I pass along the lessons I've learned in the decades since that fateful November evening to young drivers just starting their own journeys, reminding them to never underestimate the dangers beyond the glow of their headlights, and to always be vigilant in supporting their fellow travelers. For in this world, where the road winds ever on, we must stay united against the shadows and protect the brotherhood that sustains us. I can still remember the day like it was yesterday, despite the fact that it happened years ago. It was a regular Tuesday afternoon, somewhere around 4 p.m., when I pulled into a seemingly ordinary truck stop in a small town just outside Oklahoma City. My name is Leon Kirkwood, and I'm a truck driver by trade. I've been driving big rigs for almost 20 years now. It's been a lonely life but the road has been my home for as long as I can remember. I entered the truck stop diner wearing my usual weary expression, simply wanting to grab a decent meal before hitting the road again. The waitress, a kind-looking woman named Mabel, seemed genuinely happy to see me, something I'm not always used to. As she was taking my order, that's when I noticed him, Chester Blackwood. He was sitting at the end of the counter, nursing his black coffee, and looking like he was waiting for someone. If only I had known then how dangerous those red eyes were. Nothing seemed out of place that afternoon. The diner chattered with steady conversation between truckers swapping tales of their journeys and local folk discussing events in their small town bubble. Little did we know what sinister undercurrent was about to change everything. It wasn't until a woman called out from the ladies' room, her voice trembling with fear, that everything took an abrupt turn for the worse. Her name was Carolyn Shaw, and as she stumbled out of the restroom, gripping her bleeding arm tightly with a look of confusion and terror in her eyes, we understood something was horribly wrong. In all honesty, I didn't know who Carolyn Shaw was before this day. Turns out she worked at the local bank and would often come to the diner for lunch. Folks here quickly filled me in on her story as we tended to her wound. A maniacal laughter echoed through our ears as we huddled around her while Chester shamelessly sat at the counter, taking another sip of his coffee. The puzzling part was how no one had seen anyone enter or leave the restroom except for Carolyn. It quickly became clear that Chester was involved somehow. The change in atmosphere was sudden. What was once a friendly conversation had shifted into a tense investigation, one where everyone eyed each other with suspicion. Minutes later, two local police officers entered the diner after receiving a call about the disturbance. In an effort to maintain law and order, they started asking questions and were eager to detain Chester as the primary suspect due to his suspicious demeanor. But before they could apprehend him, he leaped over the counter and savagely attacked one of the officers. Pandemonium erupted. 
Inhuman strength and determination coursed through Chester's veins as he clawed, ripped, and fought his way out of that diner. Customers and officers alike tried to stop him, but it was no use. It seemed as if nothing could bring him down. And just like that, he was gone, bloodied and free, leaving a trail of carnage behind him. It wasn't until days later, after I had left town on my next haul, that I came across a newspaper article detailing Chester Blackwood's past, a deeply disturbed individual with a string of violent incidents behind him. Nobody ever deep dug far enough to discover his killing spree going on for years. Only then did everything click into place. That small town bore witness to an evil none of us could have ever imagined, leaving us all haunted by the memories we can never forget. As the years went by, the memories of that fateful day continued to haunt me. Fellow truckers would sometimes bring up the story as a cautionary tale, told in hushed voices around campfires and truck stop lounges. Yet certain aspects of the story remained shrouded in mystery, questions remained unanswered, and an overwhelming sense of unease lingered like a dark shadow. Chester Blackwood had been on the run ever since, popping up in headlines every now and then, stories of new victims left in his wake spreading like cancer across the country. Every time I found myself back at that truck stop, I couldn't help but think about Carolyn Shaw and the terror she experienced. Mabel was no longer there. She had moved on to another town, seeking refuge from an event that shook her to her core. The whole town changed since that day. A sense of distrust underpinned nearly every interaction between residents and outsiders alike. I often wondered if there was anything I could have done differently to prevent the brutal attack or capture Chester before he fled into the unknown. But that day would forever be etched in my mind as a grim reminder of the darkness lurking beneath seemingly ordinary people and places a truth I had grown accustomed to as I turned my gaze toward those red eyes in my rearview mirror and pressed down hard on the accelerator, determined never to look back.